Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto awakened with the primordial power of Ultimate Hunter, the strongest hunter in world? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. After getting the report on the failed Sasuke retrieval mission, the council was in an uproar. The civilians and elders were blaming the failure on Naruto Uzumaki while the clan heads and shinobi council were defending him. That demon brat is the reason why we lost Uchiha-sama. I say we execute him as a warning to all of our ninja who fail important missions, a merchant civilian said while the rest agree. The clan heads, Sumei mostly were releasing murderous intent on these power-hungry fools. How dare you! That boy has done nothing but stay loyal to this village and just because he failed to bring back that Uchiha you want to execute him. She yells because she respects Naruto for his loyalty to the village that has scorned him since he was born while Shibi nods. I see no logic in executing the boy for a failed mission. I agree with Sume-san on this. Yasha Haruno snorted. Like we care what you freaks think. That boy is the reason why we lost the most powerful bloodline in our village. Shibi's hand twitched while Sume snarled at the pink-haired slut. I'd rather be freaked than a money-hungry slut and if you insult me one more time Haruno I'll rip out your vocal cords, she said while flexing her claws to prove her point. Shikaku decided to speak up. Just because you can't tell the difference between the fox and the boy doesn't give you the right to execute him. For all we know it could result in the fox breaking free and continuing what it started 13 years ago. The Nara stated. What would the Yandaimi think if he saw how you fools were dishonoring his last wish? Inoichi asked. Who cares what he thinks? He's dead and it's because of that brat, another civilian council member says. The arguing continued for 15 minutes until Tsunade slammed her fist on the table. Enough? Naruto will not be executed because he falls under my jurisdiction due to the fact that he's a ninja. You civilians have no say in the matter, the last Senju said. No but if the majority of us order his banishment then you can't do anything about it Hokage-sama. Danzo said with a smirk on his face as do the elders. Tsunade and the clan heads look at them in shock. What? she yelled. We should do a vote. Hands raised for Naruto Uzumaki's banishment? Danzo asked. He, Kaharu, Hamaru, and the civilian council raised their hands. Hands raised against the banishment? Tsunade and the clan council raised their hands but frowned as they were outvoted. The others smirked as they finally got rid of the demon brat. Naruto Uzumaki is banished from Konohagakure and Hai no Kuni and if he's not out of the village or country in less than three days he'll be declared as a missing nin and killed on sight. The warhawk stated. Tsunade clenched her fists and growled but then smiled at them making them shiver. Fine. Naruto Uzumaki will be banished from fire country. Now as for the Uchiha, he will be put into the bingo book and will be declared as a B-ranked missing nin with a kill on sight order. And for compensation for his actions, his clan's treasures, scrolls, money, and property will be taken and split up upon the clan heads and his status as a clan member will be null and voided by order of the Godem Hokage. She said while inwardly smiling because she hated the Uchihas. The clan heads smirked at her actions while the civilians went into an uproar demanding that she change her decision until she yelled. Shut the hell up right now or I'll have you all removed from the council, she roared as they all shut it up. You fools praise that traitor as if he was Kami yet you treat the hero of this village like he was the devil reincarnated. My decision is final and this meeting is over. I have to go tell our hero that he's been banished by the very people and village he swore to protect she said before walking out but then turns around to look at them. You better pray that this doesn't come to bite us back in the ass because if it does, you have yourselves to blame. Tsunade then walks out of the council room while tears run down her face and cursing herself for not doing more for the boy she thought of her grandson. Naruto's hospital room the boy stared at the ceiling with a blank expression on his face. Sakura came in earlier yelling at him for not bringing back her Sasuke-kun and said that she never wanted to see him again and walked out. His so-called sensei didn't even bother to come check up on him and probably blames him for not bringing Sasuke back. Didn't I tell you Kit? No matter what you do these ninjin will never accept you. You should leave this hellhole and be done with them. To hell with your dream, they would never accept you as their cage. You know I'm right. 
Kayubi said as she heard the boy grunt. He hated to admit it, but she was right. They would never let him be Hokage no matter what he did. Could this day get any worse? He said to himself until he saw Tsunade walk in his room with a sadden expression on his face. What's wrong Oba-chan? He asked. I'm sorry Naruto but, you are banished from the village by order of the council. You have three days to leave the country or you will be declared a missing nin and killed on sight, she choked out. Naruto's eyes widened but he then hangs his head down and tears fell from his face. So they finally found a way to get rid of me huh? I should have known this would happen sooner or later. Oh well, at least I'm finally out of this shit hole. He gets out of the bed and gives her a hug. She hugs him back while her tears fell on his blonde hair. Goodbye Okawa-san. And give Nei chan and Tondan a hug for me. He says and lets go of her as she sobs while clutching her arms. Naruto then heads back to his apartment and packs everything he has but burns all of those jumpsuits he had and puts on a black one on. He then sneaks out at night but not before blowing up his apartment complex as a distraction. He then heads out of the gate without looking back at the village because it was no longer his concern. He was free to live his life and didn't have to worry about people glaring at him or trying to kill him on his birthday. He smiled a true smile and muttered two words. I'm free. Ha said as he vanished into the dark forest. At the Hokage Tower Tsunade was sitting in her office drinking her sake while Shizun sighed. That's when Jiraiya appeared in a puff of smoke grinning. Hey Haim how's it going? He asked in a cheery voice. Jiraiya please I'm not the mood to deal with you right now. She said while looking out the window. The toad sage looks at her with a confused look on his face. What's wrong? Did the gaki switch your sake with toilet water again? He asked and snickered at the memory. Tsunade looks up at him and glares. No you baka it's worse. The retrieval mission failed and those bakas on the council blamed him for it failing and they banished him. She cried and slammed the sake bottle on the desk. Jiraiya gave her a look of shock. I must have had something in my earheim. Care to repeat that? He asked again. They banished him damn it. He's gone Jiraiya gone. She yelled while tears fell from her face. They what? Those baka, s. Those short-minded ignorant self-centered bakas. Do they have any idea who they just banished? He yelled releasing murderous intent like no tomorrow. Jiraiya. Tsunade started to say but then he glared at her. Tsunade please. I don't want to hear it. Not now. Minato you stupid fool you should have let me or sensei seal the fox into your son. He growled and then left the office but not before slamming the door hard scaring Shizun and Tonton who was hiding behind the med nin. Well that went well. She mumbled. That was when Kaharu and Homura walked in like they were in charge but Tsunade looked up at them with hate in her eyes. If you've come here to tell me to take that traitor out of the bingo book then you better get out before I decide to use you too as my personal punching bags. She said in a dark tone and then cracked her knuckles. They both gulp and then leave in fear not wanting to face her wrath. Damn vultures. She mutters and grabs her sake bottle and drinks out of it. Naruto was now at a shinobi store in a village in river country buying some more shinobi gear including weights and scrolls. He was happy because he finally had decent weapons. After paying for the items he heads out of the village and heads to marsh country but little did he know that Donzo's root Anbu were tailing him. Kit, we're being followed. The vixen warned while Naruto nodded. I sense ten of them. He says as he pulls out a few smoke bombs out. He then throws them to the ground and they explode into a black smoke screen. Naruto takes this opportunity and runs into the forest at top speed. There's no way I'm fighting those guys. He muttered as he continues to run. Back in Konoha Jiraiya was pissed. No he was beyond pissed. He was no mad that if looks could kill, no one would be alive right now. He was so tempted to summon Gamabunta and let him raise this village to the ground but couldn't. He went from pissed, to angry, to sad, he failed, he failed Minato and Kashina, and failed his godson. To make it worse, he believed Serutobi when he said he would make sure Naruto was taken care of. I can't believe that I thought Sensei would look after him. I'm such a fool. I never should have believed him. I should have taken him with me when Kashina disappeared. Some godfather I turned out to be. I'm sorry Minato, I failed. He said as he headed out of the main gate. This village was beyond saving. It is nothing more than a rotting leaf what will wither away. With Naruto the blonde Jinchuriki is not having a good day. He was tired, exhausted, and pissed. 
His black jumpsuit had tears, scorch marks, and cuts on it and blood was coming down his face from his forehead. He was clutching onto his right arm that had a gash on it and couldn't get it to stop bleeding because the sword one of the roots use was coated with poison that stopped his healing abilities. Right now he was backed up against a tree and was panting heavily, he managed to kill one of them but the rest were closing in on him. This is it. I'm gonna be killed. Damn it I can't let it end like this. But what do I do? Time begins to slow as the root members charge at him with their blades poised to kill but then they suddenly stop when they heard growling then more growls are heard around the dense jungle. What kind of animal sounds like that? A male root anbu asks as he looks around. They suddenly tense up as they see a pair of glowing red slitted eyes staring at him from the bushes. Then more appear only the eyes range from green, yellow, orange, and red. The root anbu were surrounded by the glowing eyes and were waiting for them to attack. The first pair of eyes appear out of the bushes as its growl increase. Donzo's drones had look of shock, awe, and fear. Wh what the hell is that? A female root asked as she readied her ninjutsu to kill this strange creature. The creature was in a way reptilian. It was 6 feet tall, 13 feet long and weighed around 200 pounds. Its skin tone is a blackish brown color, had a two light blue stripes starting from its neck to the end of its tail and was white on the bottom. The creature also had a crest on the middle of its nose that was red and it had feather quills on the back of its head that stopped to the end of its neck. Red eyes with slit were staring the root down. It also had a long thick tail that it could probably be used for combat, but that's not what freaked them out. On its long arms were three pairs of long black curved claws that appeared to be razor sharp and on its feet were three claws but the third one was longer and stood straight up and looked like it could cut a person open with a mere twitch. The creature then snarled and opened its maw, revealing a pair of razor-sharp teeth that could rip through flesh like it was paper. This creature was a raptor. A predator beyond predators. It then crouched down a little while growling and then leapt into the air, shocking the root and Naruto, not believing that a creature of that mass could jump so high. It then landed between Naruto and the drones and looks at Naruto with a calculating eye. Said blonde felt like pissing his pants as it moved its large head towards his and sniffed him a few times. It eyes widen a little but then return to normal and then turns its body towards the roots and snarls at them. It then lets out a high-pitched roar shocking everyone. It lasted for a few seconds until the roots fears. Thirteen more of them appear from the bush and in different colors. Some were dark brown with green slitted eyes. Others were whitish gray with blackish brown spots and yellow slitted eyes and the rest were orange with tiger-like stripes and orange slitted eyes. They had the roots trapped and were approaching them with caution. The raptors snarled and hissed at them. Saliva was dripping from their teeth and their claws were poised to attack. Each one was anxious to rip them apart and to have the taste of flesh and blood in their mouths. Adrenaline was pumping through their body. They were excited at the fact that they'll eat well since there is plenty of food for them. They were waiting for their leader to give the command. They were ready. These ninjin had the nerve to intrude in their territory and now they were prey. The root were trembling in fear but held their ground with their swords ready to strike. The alpha in Naruto's opinion looked like it had a grin on its face, almost as if it was mocking the masked humans who thought they were the dominant species. The predator snorted at the thought. His species are natural born killers. They know the surroundings of this place through their genes. He will admit, the ninjin he's faced, killed, and Eden may have gained unique abilities, but they were still weak in his opinion. Not to mention that they are cowards who will betray each other at the last second. For some reason, Naruto felt sorry for the roots. He also prayed to Kami that the leader wasn't saving him for last because he didn't want to be on the menu. That was when the leader let out a loud roar that probably meant attack. The raptors roared back and then charged at the root with the intent to kill. One root rushed at one of them and trusted his blade forward and having it impale the creature's head. The raptor to the shock of the masked ninja dodged the blade and lunged forward with its maw opened, ready to crush his head while the ninja tries to block the attack with his arm. Big mistake. The raptor clamps its jaws shut on his arm. He screams out in pain at the pressure from the bite and tries to use the sword in his free hand to stab the predator in the throat but another one appears behind him and bites down on his shoulder. Blood sprays on its face. The ninja's screams grow louder as the one on its arms shoves him to the ground and they proceed on ripping him apart with their claws and teeth in a fast rate. 
The female root barley managed to evade the jaws of one and swung her blade at it only for it to stop the attack with its teeth and shattered the blade. She steps back in shock while another swings a tail at her and knocks her to the ground. The other raptor leaps and lands on her. Its sickle claw then impales her stomach and rips it open and her insides and blood spills out. She lets out a cry of agony while the other starts to rip out her entrails out and the other one held her down. Naruto watched in horror as he saw these creatures rip apart the root whose screams echoed through the jungle. One was dragged into the bushes by two of them and was torn apart. The sight of blood and organs were spraying all over the vegetation and Naruto couldn't help but turn green at the sight. Never before has he seen something so graphic. Other roots had their arms and legs ripped off forcefully. These raptors were vicious, fast, and merciless and were also very smart because they avoided being hit by their weapons. Ten minutes later the place was quiet and the pack of raptors were feasting on the dead bodies of the roots. Naruto who watched the whole thing did the only thing he could do. He fainted which made the leader look at him wondering if he was still alive. He then approaches the blonde and nudges the unconscious boy for a while. He then barks at one of the male raptors who approach him and tilts his head over at the boy. The orange-colored predator looks at Naruto for a while and blinks. The alpha growls and chirps at the male who nods his head walks over to Naruto. He picks the unconscious boy up by his hood with his teeth and places him on the leader's back who runs off into the deep jungle with the boy. Kayubi, who was watching the scene through Naruto's mind chuckled. I should have known that contract was still around. Only his family's blood were able to summon him and his kin. Perhaps this boy will be the one to destroy that man and his clan's accursed eyes. Madara Uchiha. You and your clan are a plague to this world and I'll make sure every single one of you end up in the stomach of the Shinigami. She growled and her eyes glowed red. Cabin in the jungles of marsh country. Naruto groaned as he slowly opened his deep cerulean eyes. He woke up to find himself in a bed and his jacket and shirt were gone. He had his pants on but his chest, right arm, and forehead was bandaged. He looked over on a desk and saw a bowl of fruit and cooked meat on a plate. Naruto got up but grunted out in pain because of the pain in his arm. He then walked over to the plate and took a piece of meat off it and sniffed it. He then licked it with his tongue and took a small bite out of it. After he swallowed it, he then took a bigger bite out of it and proceeded to eat that and the fruit. After he ate it he found a pair of blue cargo pants and a white shirt laid out for him. He puts that on and walks out of the room. Did you sleep well? A feminine voice asked. Naruto turned his head to see a female wearing a blue cloak with a hood covering most of her face but she was smiling. She wore a red shirt with a black flak jacket and red cargo pants. Who are you and where is that creature I saw earlier? He asked wishing he had a kanai on him. The hooded woman sighs and replies. Those were my summons. I usually have them patrol this area. I'm sorry if they scared you. She apologized. Naruto grinned sheepishly. Yeah, I'm just glad they didn't have me for dessert. She chuckles but then her smile drops and tears fell from her eyes. Naruto. I'm sorry, she says while he looks at her with a confused look on his face. How do you know my name and why are you apologizing for, for not realizing that you've been alive this whole time? I'm sorry I didn't come back for you B but those bastard elders told me you died when the Kyubi attacked and I was so distraught and hurt when I lost your father that I didn't even bother to come back for you. She then walks over to him and pulls him into a hug and cries on the top of his head. Please. Don't hate me Naru-chan. I swear I didn't know, I didn't know. Naruto blinks for a while and was a little uncomfortable with a stranger hugging him. Who exactly are you? He asked. She then lets go of him. Naruto if I tell you who I am will you promise not to explode on me? I won't I promise and I never break my promises, he says. Naruto I'm your Ka-san. She says as she removes her hood revealing a woman with red hair, blue eyes, and the face of an angel. Naruto's eyes widen and his hands hang down to his side. She's been alive this whole time but why didn't she come back for wait? She said some bastard elders in Konoha told her I died but why would they? Who is my father anyway? Oji said my parents died when Q attacked. His head hung down and his hair covered his eyes. Keiko-san. Can you do his one favor for me? He asked with a shaky voice. Kashina looked at him and knelt down to his level. He looked up at her with tears in his eyes. See can I have another hug? He asked her and she instantly hugged him even tighter while he sobs onto her shoulder and returns the hug hoping that this wasn't a dream or illusion. Right now he was happy. 
happy that he had family in this world even if it's just his mother. Kashina kissed him on the forehead and told him everything was going to be okay now. After that little reunion Naruto told her how his life was in Konoha and to say she was pissed was an understatement. How dare those fools do this to my son. Worse they dishonored Minato-kun's dying wish. I'm so glad that I took Minato's inheritance with me. They will pay. I swear Konoha will pay for this, she said. Don't worry about them Sochi. They can't get to you anymore. So tell me did any good things happen to you? She asked and Naruto's grin grew. He told her about all of the awesome parts of his life. Kashina's jaw dropped and her eyes were ready to bulge out of her head. Her face returned to normal and she grinned. So my boy not only had a bridge named after him, he is also the hero of not one, not two, not three, but four countries. Ha, take that Fugaku Tem my son is better than yours. She said while pumping her fist in the air. Naruto sweat dropped as did Kayubi. So she's who I get my energy from. He mumbled. After that Kashina told him who his father was and Naruto couldn't help but be happy. It hurt him that his father the Yandaimi had to give up everything for that village but understood his reasons. I'll make you proud dad. I'll become even greater than you. Even if I can't become Hokage, I'll be the strongest ninja in the world. He said while Kashina smiled. Naruto-kun I'm taking you back to my former home whirlpool country to train you in the ways of the hunter and assassin. She said while he looked at her in shock. Let me explain. See before my homeland was destroyed, the Uzumaki clan was a clan of hunters and assassins who were unrivaled. We usually take on missions that not even Anbu would do due to the high death risks involved. We also have a Keke Genke called Shinkoke, spiritual blessing. It is a chakra-based bloodline of the Uzumaki clan, this bloodline makes it so an Uzumaki clan member has five times the regular amount of chakra control one has, making even ninja with cage level status look weak in comparison but the downside is that with the amount of chakra control means a person needs to have a near supernatural physical endurance and physical energy or else the control won't make a difference without any power to go with the used technique. Do you understand so far son? Kashina asks while Naruto nods in shock she smiles back. Good, also you should know that you also have your father's bloodline also. It's what gave him his title the Kiroi Senku, Yellow Flash. It's called Shinsuku, God Speed. I don't know much about it but from what Minato Koi told me it's a bloodline trait of the Namikaze clan that had been given to them by the Shunshin, Flash Goddess, herself. The bloodline grants the person the ability to move at godlike speeds and some could go just as fast or faster than the speed of light itself. Naruto's jaw was on the floor as she finished explaining his two sans bloodline trait and can't help but grin like a madman. Kashina saw this and laughed. So when do we start training Ka-san? He asks while she stops laughing. Soon son but first let me tell you about our summoning contract because it was also the reason why we're pool country was nearly wiped out. Our contract was considered the strongest and oldest of any other and has been around since the Rakuto Senen, Sage of the Six Paths, founded Ninjutsu and created the Shinobi world. This contract is known as the Ancient Creature Contract. The creatures in this contract are beings that have lived since the forming of the world and even before the Biju were known. Not only that, but the creatures who created this contract are capable going toe to toe against any summon or Biju with their leader being on par with the Kyubi. Kashina explained while Naruto's eyes widened. A summon whose power is on par with the Q. Unreal. Wow. So can you summon him Ka-san? He asked while she shook her head. No but I can't summon his mate who is the second boss and she is one who you do not want to piss off Sochi. She said shuddering at the thought. Naruto blinked a few times and realized something. Wait. You said he has a mate who's the second boss. I thought there's only one boss for a contract. Most do only have one boss but there are a few rare ones that have two who are mates and there are also sub-bosses who the main boss or bosses leave in charge of a certain group of summons. Naruto scratches his head in confusion and Kashina couldn't help but giggle at her son's face. Don't worry son once we start your training I will help you with the more difficult things. Shouldn't you know most of this stuff already? She asked Naruto looks down at the floor. No. My academics in the ninja academy were screwed up by those teachers and my sensei was too busy sucking up to the Uchiha. He muttered while Kashina was shocked that they would go so far as to ruin his ninja career. She puts a hand around her son to comfort him. Don't worry Sochi because when I'm done with you, no one, 
not even the Sanin will be a match for you. Kashina then gives him a serious look. Listen Naruto, the training I'm gonna give you is not something you should take lightly. I'm gonna work you to the ground and to the point where it'll hurt for you to blink. It's possible that you could die during this training. Do you still want to do this Naruto? Naruto looks at her and can tell that she is not kidding. He ponders for a moment and then nods. Yes, I want to do this Ka-san. I don't care how tough the training is. I want to make you and dad proud of me. I will surpass two san and I will become so strong that even the heavens will know my name. I swear on our family's name that I will not let you down Ka-san. He said as his blue eyes burned with strength and determination. Kashina couldn't help but smile at his determination. She then walks over to the couch and picks up a black coat that has white fur around the collar, the Nadime's outfit minus the armor. Here son, put this on. We're going to Whirlpool Country to start your training. I also know a few friends in Karigakar that can help you also. I know about this Akatsuki group that's after you so we should get going. Naruto nads but is curious about something. I thought Whirlpool was destroyed Ka-san. Said Namikaze rubbed the back of her head in embarrassment and a blush appeared on her face. The village yes but not the environment. There are still plants and animals there but most of them are dangerous and full of creatures that most people haven't seen. Naruto sweat drops at his mom for getting something important. Oh, he says and puts the coat on. Shall we get going Ka-san? Naruto asks while she nods. Yes let's go and start your tour I mean training. She said with a glint in her eye that made a shiver go down Naruto's spine. For some reason I keep seeing the image of the Shinigami hovering over my mother's head pointing at me. He thought while Kayubi was laughing her head off in the cage feeling sorry for her container. In Konoha, when word got out in the village that Naruto was banished the villagers partied saying that they were free of the demon brat but most of the younger generation was confused at why they called him a demon when he hasn't done anything wrong. Sakura didn't care that he was gone and was glad that she didn't have to look at that idiot for the rest of her life. Uruka was pissed that this happened and when he heard Kakashi say that he didn't deserve to be a ninja due to his lack of skill and talent, he punched the man right in the face and sent him flying into a building and threatened to cripple him if he ever said anything bad about Naruto. The same went with everyone else who insulted Naruto. Tsunade, who read Kakashi's reports on the team's progress, was pissed. He only taught Naruto and Sakura tree climbing while he taught Sasuke the Chidori, some fire jutsu, and Lee's taijutsu style. Hokage Tower Tsunade was giving the son of the White Fang her most cold and icy glare while he was shifting his feet around nervously. The other Junin senseis were in the room looking at Kakashi wondering what he did to piss of the female Sanin. I've read the reports on your squad's progress Hitaki and I have to say this is the biggest load of crap I've ever read. She said while he looked at her nervously. WH what do you mean Hokage-sama? He asked but then jumped when she slammed the report on the desk making Shizune and the others cringe. Cut the bullshit Hitaki. I'm talking about how you trained your students. What the hell have you been doing with them? She demanded while Kakashi gulped. W well you see I. He started to say but then was cut off by the leader of Konoha. Shut up. I don't want your stupid ass excuses. I want the truth. Now tell me why you only taught Naruto and Sakura tree walking while taking that Uchiha brat off for private training. Everyone's eyes grew wide when they heard that. What do you mean Hokage-sama? Asuma asked while looking at Kakashi who had a bead of sweat going down his face. Tsunade then looks at the other Junin senseis. Tell me guy, you have the most experienced team right now so tell me, what have you taught them for the last year? She asked. Guy then rubs his chin for a while then answers. I've taught them the chakra control exercises, had them work on their teamwork and offered them some extra training if they wanted it as well as gave them advice if they needed anything. The spandex wearer answered. Tsunade nodded and looked at Kurenai. And you Kurenai? The genjutsu mistress thought for a moment and replied. The same as Guy and if I couldn't help them with their questions or give them good advice I would recommend another person to help them. She answered and the last Senju looked at Asuma. Same here Hokage-sama but if I may ask what does our form of training have to do with Kakashi? He asked while Kakashi gulped. Simple Asuma, compared to all of you Kakashi here is a fuck-up. She said while the copy nin flinched. 
Hitaki here spent the last nine months giving the now traitor private training while leaving his other two to rot and practically end up getting themselves killed. It was by pure luck that they survived their first a rank mission as well as their first shunan exam. What's worse is that when the now banished Naruto Uzumaki asked him for help when he had to face Neji Hayuga for the Chunin exams he refused to help him and left him with a Junin who was like most of the villagers. They all looked at him in shock and Kurinai narrowed her eyes at him. As what the Hokage said true Kakashi, did you neglect two of your students just to train the Uchiha? She asked saying the traitor's name with venom in her voice while the silver-haired Junin just looked away. Answer her question Hitaki did you or did you not neglect your two students for the Uchiha? Tsunade commanded while Kakashi sighed and looked at Kurinai. Yes I did but my reason for doing it was, smack. He tried to explain but ended up getting slapped hard in the face courtesy to Kurinai Yuhi. Tsunade just watched and the male Junin looked at her with wide eyes. Reason, reason, you have a fucking reason for neglecting two of your students. Yelled Kurinai while the males in the room backed away not wanting to face her wrath. Kakashi had a look of shock on his face and slowly turned his head towards an angry Kurinai. Tell me your reason for neglecting two of your students and don't give me any bullshit because right now I feel like beating the shit out of you. The Genjutsu mistress said while releasing murderous intent on the frightened man. I I did it be because Naruto didn't show a any talent as a ninja and D doesn't deserve to be one. H he only managed to get this far by L luck. He replies. When those words came out of his mouth the room temperature dropped. Tsunade, Kurinai, and Shizun were glaring holes into the scarecrow's head. That's it. That's your reason for neglecting his training. Because you thought he didn't have any talent. She said in a low voice Kakashi nodded. Big mistake. Kurinai suddenly grabbed him by the collar of his flak jacket and slammed him into the wall. You fucking idiot. That's the biggest load of shit I've ever heard. No talent. He beat Neji and that kid from Suna and you have the nerve to say he doesn't have any talent. She roared. Kakashi was struggling to remove her hands. Kurinai I, smack. He wheezed out but then got slapped again by her. Shut the fuck up you pathetic excuse of a ninja. You're always spouting those who break the rules are trash but those who abandon their comrades are less than trash well guess what? Question mark. You're lower than trash. I can't believe you'd do that to him especially when these short-minded fools made his life a living hell. The Yandaimi would be disgusted with you. You, re nothing but a damn hypocrite. She yelled while Asuma and Guy struggled to get her off of Kakashi when they do. Kakashi falls to the ground gasping for air while Kurinai gives him her deadliest glare and spits on his face and calls him scum. Guy and Asuma release her and she storms out of the room and slams the door while they just stare at the door. While Asuma rubs the back of his head. Uh, sorry about her outburst Hokage-sama. He says while the last Senju waves it off. Think nothing of it Asuma I don't blame Kurinai for snapping like that. You and Guy are dismissed. She said and they nod but send Kakashi their own glares and then Shunshin out of the tower. Tsunade then gets up and slowly walks towards Kakashi who was still on the ground with his head down. She then grabs him by his hair and lifts him up till his eyes meet hers. Consider what Kurinai said to you as a form of mercy. As for your punishment you are being demoted to Chunin status and you be spending the next two years doing double guard duty and will also be doing C rank missions and your pay will be cut in half after every mission. After that you'll be teaching at the academy until I deem you fit for the Junin rank. Now get out Chunin. Your shift starts tomorrow and if you're late even once I'll have you thrown in jail for insubordination and your porn books will be burned by Kurinai Yuhi or any other Kunoichi I pick. And tell that pink-haired brat outside to enter. She said as she released him and he walked out with his shoulders slumped. After he walked out Sakura walked in with a nervous look on his oops I mean her face. Why you wanted to see me H Hokage-sama? She asked while the Senju walked back to her desk and sat down. Yes I did and I want to let you know that your shinobi license is of right now suspended. She said while said girl jumped out of her seat with a shocked look on her face. What why? She yelled out. Shut up and sit down brat. Tsunade ordered and she did while whimpering. Look at you. You're pathetic and an embarrassment to Kunoichi everywhere. You young lady are going back to the academy to get re-educated and also you'll be doing solo D rank mission without pay. Depending on how you progress I might reinstate your license. 
and you can forget about being my apprentice because you don't deserve it. Now get you sorry ass out of my building. She ordered and the pink-haired girl left the office wondering what she did to deserve this. Tsunade sighs and looks out the window and can't help but think that Naruto's banishment will come back to bite them in the butt and that is one bet she will no doubt win. Naruto Uzumaki is banished from Kanahagakure and Haino Kuni and if he's not out of the village or country in less than three days he'll be declared as a missing nin and killed on sight. The war hawk stated. You fools praise that traitor as if he was Kami yet you treat the hero of this village like he was the devil reincarnated. My decision is final and this meeting is over. I have to go tell our hero that he's been banished by the very people and village he swore to protect. Tsunade said. Didn't I tell you Kit? No matter what you do these ninjin will never accept you. You should leave this hellhole and be done with them. To hell with your dream, they would never accept you as their cage. You know I'm right. Kayubi said to her container. I'm sorry Naruto but, you are banished from the village by order of the council. You have three days to leave the country or you will be declared a missing nin and killed on sight. She choked out. Naruto's eyes widen but he then hangs his head down and tears fell from his face. So they finally found a way to get rid of me huh? I should have known this would happen sooner or later. Oh well, at least I'm finally out of this shithole. They what? Those bakas, those short-minded ignorant self-centered bakas. Do they have any idea who they just banished? He yelled releasing murderous intent like no tomorrow. Jiraiya, Tsunade started to say but then he glared at her. Tsunade please, I don't want to hear it. Not now. Minato you stupid fool you should have let me or sensei seal the fox into your son. He growled and then left the office but not before slamming the door. I can't believe that I thought sensei would look after him. I'm such a fool, I never should have believed him. I should have taken him with me when Kashina disappeared. Some godfather I turned out to be. I'm sorry Minato, I failed. He said as he headed out of the main gate. The raptors roared back and then charged at the root with the intent to kill. One root rushed at one of them and trusted his blade forward and having it impale the creature's head. The raptor to the shock of the masked ninja dodged the blade and lunged forward with its maw open, ready to crush his head while the ninja tries to block the attack with his arm. Big mistake. The raptor clamps its jaws shut on his arm. He screams out in pain at the pressure from the bite and tries to use the sword in his free hand to stab the predator in the throat but another one appears behind him and bites down on his shoulder. Blood sprays on its face. The ninja's screams grow louder as the one on its arms shoves him to the ground and they proceed on ripping him apart with their claws and teeth in a fast rate. The female root barley managed to evade the jaws of one and swung her blade at it only for it to stop the attack with its teeth and shattered the blade. She steps back in shock while another swings its tail at her and knocks her to the ground. The other raptor leaps and lands on her. Its sickle claw then impales her stomach and rips it open and her insides and blood spills out. She lets out a cry of agony while the other starts to rip out her entrails out and the other one held her down. Naruto watched in horror as he saw these creatures rip apart the root whose screams echoed through the jungle. Did you sleep well? A feminine voice asked. Naruto turned his head to see a female wearing a blue cloak with a hood covering most of her face but she was smiling. Who are you? Naruto I'm your Ka-san. She says as she removes her hood revealing a woman with red hair blue eyes, and the face of an angel. Naruto-kun I'm taking you back to my former home whirlpool country to train you in the ways of the hunter and assassin. She said while he looked at her in shock. Listen Naruto, the training I'm gonna give you is not something you should take lightly. I'm gonna work you to the ground and to the point where it'll hurt for you to blink. It's possible that you could die during this training. Do you still want to do this Naruto? Naruto looks at her and can tell that she is not kidding. He ponders for a moment and then nods. Yes, I want to do this Ka-san. I don't care how tough the training is. I want to make you and dad proud of me. I will surpass two San and I will become so strong that even the heavens will know my name. I swear on our family's name that I will not let you down Ka-san. He said as his blue eyes burned with strength and determination. I've read the reports on your squad's progress Hitaki and I have to say this is the biggest load of crap I've ever read. She said while he looked at her nervously. WH what do you mean Hokage-sama? He asked but then jumped when she slammed the report on the desk making Shizune and the others cringe. 
Cut the bullshit Hitaki. I'm talking about how you trained your students. What the hell have you been doing with them? She demanded while Kakashi gulped. W well you see I, he started to say but then was cut off by the leader of Konoha. Shut up. I don't want your stupid ass excuses. I want the truth. Now tell me why you only taught Naruto and Sakura tree walking while taking that Uchiha brat off for private training. Kurinai narrowed her eyes at him. As what the Hokage said true Kakashi. Did you neglect two of your students just to train the Uchiha? Yes I did but my reason for doing it was, smack. He tried to explain but ended up getting slapped hard in the face courtesy to Kurinai Yuhi. Tsunade just watched and the male Junin looked at her with wide eyes. Reason. Reason. You have a fucking reason for neglecting two of your students. Yelled Kurinai while the males in the room backed away, not wanting to face her wrath. Kakashi had a look of shock on his face and slowly turned his head towards an angry Kurinai. Tell me your reason for neglecting two of your students and don't give me any bullshit because right now I feel like beating the shit out of you. The Genjutsu mistress said while releasing murderous intent on the frightened man. I I did it be because Naruto didn't show A any talent as a ninja and D doesn't deserve to be one. H he only managed to get this far by L luck. He replies. When those words came out of his mouth the room temperature dropped. Tsunade, Kurinai, and Shizune were glaring holes into the scarecrow's head. That's it. That's your reason for neglecting his training. Because you thought he didn't have any talent. She said in a low voice Kakashi nodded. Big mistake. Kurinai suddenly grabbed him by the collar of his flak jacket and slammed him into the wall. You fucking idiot. That's the biggest load of shit I've ever heard. No talent. He beat Neji and that kid from Suna and you have the nerve to say he doesn't have any talent. She roared. Kakashi was struggling to remove her hands. Kurinai I. Smack. He wheezed out but then got slapped again by her. Shut the fuck up you pathetic excuse of a ninja. You're always spouting those WHO break the rules are trash but those WHO abandon their comrades are less than trash well guess what? Question mark. You're lower than trash. I can't believe you'd do that to him especially when these short-minded fools made his life a living hell. The Yandaimi would be disgusted with you. You, re nothing but a damn hypocrite. She yelled while Asuma and Guy struggled to get her off of Kakashi when they do. Kakashi falls to the ground gasping for air while Kurinai gives him her deadliest glare and spits on his face and calls him scum. Guy and Asuma release her and she storms out of the room and slams the door while they just stare at the door. I should have known that contract was still around. Only his family's blood was able to summon him and his kin. Perhaps this boy will be the one to destroy that man and his clan's accursed eyes. Madara Uchiha you and your clan are a plague to this world and I'll make sure that every single one of you end up in the stomach of the Shinigami. She growled and her eyes glowed red. Four years later, jungle country forest. The sky was dark and the light of the full moon was shining down on the forest of jungle country. The wind was blowing fast, making the plant life in the jungle sway back and forth. The cries of different animals echoed through the dark and dense jungle. It is said that night time is the time for those who have been sleeping and conserving energy during the day, come out to hunt at night. Darkness is the predator's best element because they can't be seen when they're stalking their prey. A black leopard with glowing yellow eyes moves and leaps through the trees while stalking an old wild boar who was digging through the soil with its tusks looking for shrubs and roots to eat. The hunted has to always be on alert at night because the hunter can strike from anywhere any time and if they let their guard down for even a second, it's over. The wild boar's head shoots up and turns its head in different directions while it sniffs the air and its ears also move in different directions. It can't depend on its poor eyesight so it depends on its other senses to alert it when a threat is nearby. The hunter doesn't rush an ambush, it analyzes what it hunts. Its sense of pattern how it walks, the way it moves, everything. When the hunter sees an opening it goes for it instantly. The leopard freezes and lowers its body slowly to blend with the darkness when the boar looks around. After the boar stops searching and continues to eat, the leopard slowly rises and continues to walking on the tree branch while eyeing the large pig. It then moves downwind to avoid having its scent being carried into the wind and in the boar's direction. It then crouches down and gets ready to pounce on the pig. Its claws are flexed and adrenaline is pumping into its body. The boar starts to get drowsy and starts to lie down. 
The leopard sees its chance and leaps into the air with its front claws stretched out. It lands on the startled boar and both animals wrestle on the ground. The squealing boar cries out in pain as the leopard's claws sink into its body and tears through it. The leopard avoids the tusks and when it sees the jugular it opens it maw revealing four long white canines and sinks its fangs into the pig's neck. Blood seeps onto its tongue making the big cat tighten its grip on the struggling pig's throat. The grip gets tighter and tighter until a bone-crunching snap is heard. The boar stops struggling and its body goes limp. The leopard waits for a few minutes and then drops the dead body and it releases a victory roar that echoes through the forest. It then drags the boar's body into the trees where it can eat it without having to deal with the other hunters. In the world of the wild it's survival of the fittest. Hunter be hunted, eat or be eaten, kill or be killed, and the strong live and the weak die. This theory is used throughout the world and continues on. Two screams suddenly echo through the jungle and four blurs are seen leaping through the trees of jungle country. Three males and a female wearing Iwa Junin outfits and headbands were running away as if the Shinigami was after them. They landed on the ground and looked around the forest frantically while having looks of horror and fear in their eyes. They were breathing heavily and had their kanai out. They were Kiji, Yatsuki, and Karatsuki and they were without a doubt afraid, very afraid. Oh Kami, did you see who got Seta and Jira? Who was that guy? Kiji asked. I I think that was the Ryushi Juti hunter god. He said while Yatsuki and Karatsuki eyes widen in horror and looked at him. Why you're kidding? Th that man is a myth, a scary story kids are told. Karatsuki started to sweat like crazy. She lost her older brother to that bounty hunter, assassin and when his body was brought back to the village, it was in a form that would make even a war veteran shinobi lose it. His head was gone with his body was torn to ribbons and was barely noticeable. W what do we do? We can't escape. He won't let us. This is the Ryushi Juti we're talking about. It is said that he has never lost a bounty or failed an assassination mission. For those who somehow manage to escape him will be hunted down and he will find you no matter what. He'll kill us. He'll kill us all. This is AS class going on SS class mercenary we're talking about. She shouted and heard a twig snap. Kuratsuki jumped and threw a kanai at the tree only for a dead bird to hit the ground. Damn it Tasuki calm down. He may be strong but he's only one man. We can take him if we work together. Yatsuki said with a smirk hole his teammates look at him like he was stupid. Baka, this isn't the time to get why, if we don't get out of here soon we'll die. Kiji yelled while Yatsuki scoffed at how his comrade was acting over one person. Run away if you want to coward but I'm not. Yatsuki said with a Y smile on his face. If the Ryushi Juti is so big and bad why doesn't he show himself? Hey Ryushi Juti, come on out and fight like a man. Come out and show us how scary you are. Well, I'm waiting you coward. He yelled out into the dense jungle but all that was heard was the wind. The Iwa Nin looks at his comrade smirking arrogantly. See, there's no Ryushi Juti here. You guys got worked up over no, what? Those were his last words when his body jerked backwards and was embedded into a tree branch with a black arrow lodged into his head. Kuratsuki screamed in horror when she saw her teammate's body hang on the branch with a look of shock on his face before he died. Fuck this, I'm out of here. Tasuki it was nice knowing you. Kiji said and ran off into the jungle. No, Kiji wait don't leave me here. She cried out but said Iwa Nin was long gone. Not far from Kuratsuki's location. A shadowy figure with glowing yellowish orange slitted eyes that had a tint of red in them was watching as he managed to get the Iwa who was mouthed off too much. He saw the other male run away into the jungle and couldn't help but shake his head at the coward. Fool, to leave a comrade behind in the face of danger is a cowardly act. He places his black compound bow on his back while staring at the female nin who was trembling in fear and then looks at the path the other nin went. Might as well deal with the coward. He mutters to himself and vanishes from the tree branch. Kiji was running at full speed through the jungle, swatting leaves and jumping over branches, trying to look for the border and get out of here. Sorry Tasuki, but in the ninja world it's survival of the fittest. The strong live and the weak die. That's the laws of Nadu Aj. He screamed out in pain when three arrows lodged into his body. One lodged into his spine, the other pierced his lung and the last one into the back of his knee. 
going through the bone with the arrow head sticking out of the front of his knee. He lost all feeling from his lower body and tumbled onto the ground a few times and then he rolled off into a deep ditch and hit the ground hard breaking a few ribs and dislocating his left arm. The man rolled over on his back and released a cry of agony and pain. Blood was seeping from a gash on his head and he had multiple cuts and scrapes on his body. He struggles to get up but the pain was too much. That and he could no longer feel his legs. He then looks up and his eyes widen in horror as he saw a shadowy figure was glaring down at him. Why you? I it can't be. You can't be real. You just can't. He cried out in horror. The Ryushiju T narrows his yellowish orange red tinted slitted eyes at the man while three more shadowy figures that appeared to be reptilian approached the man and growled at the trapped Iwa Nin who was trembling in fear and sweating bullets. You're not worthy to die by my hand. Instead I'll let my friends here deal with you. They haven't had a decent meal for a while and I'm sure they would enjoy tearing you apart. He replies in a dark tone while the raptors snarled, revealing razor sharp teeth and saliva dripped from their mouths. Enjoy your meal my Shiryu Hanryo, hunting partners. The Ryushi Juti replied and walked away. The raptors grinned at the whimpering Nin. They then roar and leap down into the ditch and started to rip their meal apart. Kiji's blood-curdling screams echoed through the forest due to the fact that he's being eaten alive by the ultimate predators. Kuratsuki's body was shaking like crazy when she heard the roars and Kiji screaming and after that, silence. Tears formed from her dark green eyes and she was hugging her body while her lip was quivering. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. She chanted to herself but doesn't hear the shadowy figure land behind her and looks down at the frightened Kunoichi. He then wraps his arms around her body and she lets out a yelps. He then leans next to her ear and speaks in a deep tone that wasn't cruel, dark or violent. Don't struggle Kunoichi-san I'm not going to kill you. He says and could see tears falling from her face. Ryushi Juti, she whimpered while the man nods. Hi, I'm him. Why you K killed my brother Yoshi? She said and couldn't help but blush a little when her body pressed against his well-toned one. I see. I killed that trash because he was the one kidnapping and rapping younger girls and women. Scum like him has no place in the world so I'm sorry for your loss. Did you want to avenge him? He asked while she shook her head. And no, I don't I swear, Shaw said. Good because I don't want to kill a pretty girl like you. He said in a playful voice making her eep and then got serious again. I'm gonna let you go now but you must never go back to Iwagaker. Your cage doesn't like failure and if I know that man, he'll either kill you or sell you to a brothel and I'm sure you don't want that. She nods at that and speaks. What do I do then? If I don't go back I'll become a missing nin and will be hunted down by my village's hunter nin. You leave your death to me and I assure you they will not come after you at all. He answers. Okay, I'll trust you to do that. I won't go back to Iowa at all. Kuratsuki said and he nods at her. Good but how do I know you'll keep your end of the deal? I'll need more than your word that you won't go back. He whispers and breathes into her ear. A shiver goes up her spine and she bites her lower lip. W.H. What can I do to prove to you that I'll keep my end of the deal? She asks when her blush increases while he smiles under his mask. I'm sure you know Kunoichi-chan. He says and caresses her cheek with his hand. Kuratsuki went from scared as hell to turned on in less than 8 seconds. Next morning, the sun shined through the window of a hotel room and Kuratsuki was sleeping in a bed. The sunlight hits her eyelids and she slowly opens them. Her form was covered in bed sheets and she slowly gets up while wiping a strand of her brown hair from her face. She then sees a robe on a hanger and grabs it to cover up her body. After she wraps the sash around she sees a letter on the table and picks it up to read it. If you've just started to read this letter to Suki-chan then I'm already gone. I promise to keep Iwa of your back and you'll be considered the few who have been spared by me. Hopefully. We'll meet again and if we don't then enjoy your new life and if you want to go another round then let me know and I'll be more than happy to give you a repeat of our activities from last night. Sincerely Ryushi Juti, after reading the letter the former Iwa Kunoichi couldn't help but blush and giggle pervertedly at what they did last night. That man was a stamina freak in the bed and what made it better was how big he was. She passed out after the fifth orgasm she had inside dreamily hopping that she would meet him again while looking out the window. 
The Ryushi Juti was now in the jungles of Uzu no Kuni, walking through the tropical forest and sneezed. That woman must be thinking about me. Man could she scream, he said to himself. The Ryushi Juti was 6 feet 0 and 17 years old. He wore a short-sleeved dark blue hooded trench coat and also wore a pair of black cargo pants with Anbu-styled boots. On his upper body he wore a black long-sleeved skin-tight muscle shirt that hugged his body like a second skin and showed off his arms, chest, and abs and had deep blue slitted eyes that radiated power. He also wore a grey-coloured flak jacket that was zipped up and had extra pockets on them and a collar. He also wore a black mask that covered half of his face and a pair of long blonde spiky bangs that were crimson at the ends but stopped to the sides of his face. He also had on black fingerless gloves that had metal plates on them and also wore arm guards on his arms, the ones Kakashi wore during the Third Shinobi War. Strapped to his back was a black compound bow and arrow and also a black katana. The hilt was black and had five holes and a silver metal tip at the end. The guard was silver and the sheath was black, snake eyes blade from G. I. Joe Rise of the Cobras. He also had two knives strapped to his belt as well as two on his right and left leg. He walked out of the forest. He walked out of the jungle and into a clearing where a compound that was not too big or not too small and it had a red spiral emblem on front of the roof. The roof was dark green and the compound was like any other. In the front yard were a variety of plants and in the middle of the front yard was a large fountain in the form of a T-Rex and looked like it was roaring at the sky with water falling from it. When he took his fifth step a barrage of throwing knives came at him with deadly accuracy and speed. He instantly flings his bow and arrows of his shoulders and pulls out his blade. It was a stainless steel blade with a partial serrated edge. He deflects all the knives with the katana. A figure wearing a black cloak jumped out of the trees and towards Ryushi with a katana with a red hilt and golden guard ready to slice him in half. Ryushi blocked the attack with one arm and the cloaked figure flipped over him and landed on the ground in a crouching position. She then jumps up and gets into a sword stance with her blade in a thrusting position. She had long red hair with silver highlights that was tied into a ponytail and appears to be 14. She also wore a red and black ninja outfit with arm guards and black fingerless gloves and black sandals. She wore a mask that covered half of her face and had bluish green slitted eyes. Ryushi had his left hand behind his back and twirled his sword a few times and pointed it at her. The tension in the air was thick. A leaf was slowly making its way to the grass and when it lands they then run at each other at Junin level speeds and their blades clash as they pass each other. The redhead then turns around and positions her blade into a thrusting form and aims it at Ryushi. He moves to the left as she passes him and swings his sword at her head but she ducks and ends up loosing a few strands of hair. She then swings at his legs but he leaps over her and lands back on his feet and then pulls a throwing knife out his left hand and throws it at her. She deflects it with her katana but her eyes widen when she him coming at her launching a barrage of slashes and thrusts at her. She dodges, blocks, and parries the attack while he keeps up the onslaught. The redhead then vanished when he performs a thrust at her head but then does a roundhouse kick to his right and hits the redhead in the stomach getting a grunt from her and skids back a little hold her stomach. Ryushi appears behind her and before she could react, he grabs her wrist and twists it behind her back and places sharp part of his sword at her throat. She freezes when she sees this and drops her kanai. I yield, she said while he released her. The redhead rubs her wrist painfully while he sheaves his sword. She then retrieves her sword and sheaves it. Clapping was heard and two figures walked out of the forest. On was female who was 5 feet 8 with red hair and wore a black and red ninja outfit that hugged her body. She had greenish blue cerulean slitted eyes and had the face of an angel. She wore a black trench coat and had a blue clip in her hair. She also had a nodashi strap to her back. The hilt was a blood red color and the sheath was black and red. Next to her was a man who was 6 feet 2 and wore an outfit similar to Ryushi's but it was silver grey and black. He also had shoulder length silver hair and icy blue slitted eyes. On his back was a broadsword with a double edged blade. The guard and hit were in the form of a miniature skeletal dragon, Dante's sword rebellion from Devil May Cry. They were Kashina and Anishi Uzumaki, the aka Arashi, Red Storm, and Shippo Mashin, Silver Devil. They were both S to SS rank Nin with a flea on site orders. Good show Sochi, son, Otome, daughter. Kashina said smiling at her kids. 
They both eye smile at their mother and nod. Ryushi removed his hood and mask revealing wild spiky blonde hair that stopped to his shoulders and a masculine face that was derived of baby fat and he had canines protruding from his upper lip and had a whiskerless face. He was Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. The smaller redhead removed her mask, having the same appearance as her mother and canines like her Aniki. Arigato ka san. Chu san how did I do? She asked her father who grinned at her and ruffled his daughter's hair. You did great Kasumi-chan, I'm impressed with how strong you've gotten especially at your age. He said while she blushes and rubs her nose with her finger. Yei Mouto you almost got me to use both of my arms that time. Naruto said smiling at her and flicks her on the forehead. Itai, Naruto ni don't do that. She cried while rubbing her forehead and glaring at her brother. Kashina and Anishi laugh at this and couldn't help but smile. When Kashina introduced him to her half-sister, they were inseparable. When he met Anishi, his Kifu stepfather, he was reluctant at first that he would treat him like the villagers did but the man proved him wrong and treated him like a father would treat his son and even helped in training him. Anishi's was calm, laid back, and a goof but when he's pissed or his family's lives are in danger, he becomes cold and ruthless. So Naruto how did your hunting trip go? The silver-haired man asked while Naruto snorted. Lame those Iwa Nin were pushovers so I didn't take their heads. But I did meet a hot Kunoichi and well, you know. He said while his grin grew as did Anishis who patted the blonde Namikaze on the shoulder. That's my son, just like your old man, wooing women and then getting them in bed, sniff, I couldn't be any more prouder. He said as anime tears went down his face. Kashina and Kasumi's eye twitched and smacked them both upside the head. Anishi. Do you want to sleep alone tonight? And Naruto, I'll ground you from eating ramen and dango for a month. She said making them go pale and get on their knees then beg her not to do that doing the puppy eyes jutsu. Kashina was a sucker for that jutsu and decided not to do that and they both glomped her, rubbing their cheeks against her while she struggled to breath and was turning blue. Kasumi was on the ground laughing at her mother and kicking her feet in the air. After that scene was over and Kashina got her breath back Naruto spoke up. So Ka-san how did the mission in Tea Country go? He asked while Kasumi snorted. Lame. Those aim nin were weak especially the one who had the Raijin no Ken, Sword of Thunder. His name was Aoi Rokusho and he thought the Nadaim Hokage's weapon made him invincible and resulted in him losing his head and me getting a new trophy. She said and pulls out a hilt and activates it. A yellow lightning blade appears and she then deactivates it and puts it away. What amazes me is how a weakling like him managed to steal it and get out of Konoha while not being hunted down for stealing something like this. If that's the strongest village in the elements then I don't want to see the weakest. She said to herself. Naruto's eye became icy when he thought of that village. It brought up nothing but bad memories. He was always beaten on his birthday. Stores and restaurants always kicked him out except for Ichiraku and the Higurashis who were always kind to him. His so-called friends only thought of him as the dead last and didn't take his career as a shinobi seriously. Too bad for them that he is now one of the most dangerous nin in the elemental nations with a flea on sight order. Kasumi saw the faraway look on her brother's face and frowned as did Kashina and Anishi. When Anishi found out how terrible Naruto's life was, he wanted to raise that village to the ground. Naruto ni are you okay? She asked and places a hand on his shoulder. Naruto looks at her and smiles. Yeah, I am. I'm just happy to be out of that hellhole and with my family. He said and wrapped an arm around his little sister. Imagine their reaction when they find out that I'm the Ryushi Juti. They'll be begging me to come back, but too bad for them I won't. If anything I would rather join Kumo or Kiri. He said while they nodded. Anyway I'm going to Nami no Kuni to see Tazuna and his family. You guys want to come? Naruto asks them. Kashina shakes her head as does Anishi. Sorry Naruto, but we're bushed from the traveling, but I'm sure Kasumi would like to join you. Yeah you two go on ahead to Nami. We'll be resting for a while. Anishi says and wraps an arm around Kashina's waist. Naruto and Kasumi twitch when they saw this. Yeah let's go Nisan I want to see Inari-chan and Tsunami Obasan. She replies and drags her brother away from them too. Once they were out of sight Anishi grins and moves the hand he had on her waist to her ass cheek and squeezes it, making Kashina jump a little. Eek, Anishi you pervert, 
She yells when she turns to punch him but sees him running like crazy to the compound with her in pursuit. Oi, get back here and take your punishment like a man. She screamed while he laughed as he ran into the house. Naruto and Kasumi were sitting on a crocodile that was the size of a great white shark reading the latest bounties in the bingo book. Benihime, Crimson Princess, the Kayubi was out of Naruto's body and in the form of a kid with crimson-colored fur sleeping in Kasumi's lap and purring when she scratches her behind the ears. Heini san the Stone Bear of Iwa and the Thunder Lion of Kumo's bounties went up. Want to go after them when we finish visiting Tazuna and his family? She asks while Naruto nods. Sure, I haven't faced any strong missing nin. That and I need some new trophies in my collection. He said like it was the most simple thing in the world while Kasumi sighs. When her brother faces a strong nin he keeps their heads and headbands as trophies. She does the same but keeps mostly the headbands. So how many do you have now Naruto ni? Kasumi asks as she turns a page. Naruto thinks about it and answers. 150 from Iwa, 95 from Kumo, 87 from Suna, 60 from Konoha, 75 from Kiri, Aim, and Kusa and 50 from Takiwai. He asks but she slumps her shoulders. Damn, you beat me by 25. Oh and I get the bounty on the stone bear since you got the highest one last time. She answer and shrugs his shoulders. Kasumi was without a doubt a money hungry hunter. He liked money too but she loves it. Just like Anishi but he wastes his on sake and gambling. Him and Ba Chan would get along well since they both love sake and gambling but Anishi is good at gambling. He thought while the crocodile takes them to Nami. Kanahagakur no Sato, in the Hokage Tower, Tsunade couldn't help but sigh as she looked out the window and at the village. For the past four years, Konoha has not been doing well and that is due to the fact that they banished Naruto. After his banishment got out to the other countries, the leaders that Naruto helped were furious. Tazuna, the mayor of Wave had cut off all trading routes that went through Fire Country and tripled the prices for imported and exported goods that went to Konoha and any other place in Fire Country. And traded the majority of their goods with Kumo, Kiri, and Suna and also sent all the missions they originally give Konoha to said villages. The council tried to send ambassadors to Wave and tried to make a new treaty with them but they were kicked out the second they set foot on the land by either the samurai who patrol the borders or by the hired nin. The council even went so far as to threaten and take Wave country by force. When Kumo and Kiri heard this they threatened Konoha with war if they interfered with their business again. The leader of Tea country also cut off the trading ports and businesses with Konoha and did them with Suna and Kumo. When Gara, Sunagakar's new case cage heard the news, he was mad beyond belief and he created a sandstorm that stretched all the way to Fire Country's borders. He then went to the Wind Damu's palace and asked for him to cancel the new treaty they were planning as well as cut off the alliance except the one where they assist each other in war. The Wind Daimyo asked why Angara explained what had happened to him during the Suna Odo invasion. Needless to say, the man agreed with him and cancelled the alliance and new treaty. Koyuki Kazahana, the daimyo of Harugakur, was furious beyond belief when she found out Naruto was banished from Konoha. She along with 100 of her samurai and 40 of her ninja and marched all the way to Konoha demanding an audience with the Hokage. When she had a meeting with Tsunade and the council she wanted to know why she banished Naruto from Konoha. The elders responded by saying that the council banished him when he failed to bring back the last Uchiha and also because he contained the Kayubi no Kitsune. After they said that, she rose from her seat and cursed every single one of them out, saying words that made her samurai and ninja blush. Who knew that the spring daimyo had such colorful language? After that, she cut off all alliances with them and refused to send any more missions to them and stopped sending them technology. She also refused to star in Jaria's Ika Ika movie giving the man a heart attack. The council tried to reason with her but she wouldn't hear it. She told them all to piss off and the only way she'd consider an alliance with them is if they removed Naruto's exile. Other than that, she left the village and did an alliance with Kumo and Kiri. It only got worse a few months later when the fire daimyo came demanding why he got complaints from the country leaders about the banishment of a Naruto Uzumaki and why they cut off or tripled the cost of their resources that went to their country. Once Tsunade explained the reason, the man wasn't happy and cut Konoha's military and economic budget by 40% and stated that he would send all high-ranking missions he got for them to Suna and the council asked why. 
He said it was because unlike Konoha, who dishonored the dying words of a former cage and blamed an innocent child for the deaths of many, Suna accepted their jinchuriki and made him their new cage and the new case cage said that it was thanks to Naruto that he changed his view on life. After that, he left while the council begged him to change his mind but he just ignored them. Tsunade sighed in frustration and rubbed her temples to get rid of the headache she had coming. It was the villagers' fault that they were in this condition. If only they'd honored the Yandaimi's dying wish then they wouldn't be suffering. She had her Anbu look for the blonde but the search failed. It was like he disappeared from the elemental nations. She prayed that he wasn't captured by the Akatsuki. Jiraiya's spy network couldn't even find him. Hopefully he's somewhere happy and living his life. That's when an Anbu with a cat mask appeared kneeling in front of her superior. Hokage-sama, the council is in the meeting room waiting for you to come. She replies while Tsunade nods and gets up from her seat, heading for the meeting room. Council Chambers The clan heads and elders council were in the meeting room waiting for Tsunade to appear. The door opens revealing the goddaim Hokage who went to her chair and sat down. Hokage-sama glad you could make it. We need to talk about a certain ninja that has gotten a lot of attention lately. Danzo said while opening his only eye. Tsunade sighs and rubs her temple. What ninja may I ask Danzo? I have a busy schedule so make this quick. She said in an irritated voice while the warhawk nodded. He goes by the name Ryushi Juti, Hunter God. He said getting shocked looks from everyone even from Soom. What are you talking about Danzo? The Ryushi Juti is a myth. A fairy tale grown ups make up to scare little kids. Said Inoichi, who also heard the name but thought he was just a legend. I agree with Inoichi on this one. If the Ryushi Juti was real, then we would at least have a picture or something. Choza said while Hiyashi nodded. I must agree also. There's no way for some of his reputation can be real if we don't have any proof that he is. I didn't come to this meeting to hear some child's fairy tale. The Ryushi Jote is said to a freelance bounty hunter who is said to have never lost a bounty or fail in an assassination mission. Not to mention he takes on missions that make our Anbu look like amateurs and his tracking abilities make the Inazuka clan look like a joke. The Hyuga head says while soon glares at him. I too must agree with Hiyashi-san's logic. The way people talk about this bounty hunter seems too far-fetched. It doesn't change the fact that Iwa has listed this man as an S going on SS rank Nin with a flea on site order. I'm sorry to say that this, man, is nothing more than a ghost. Shibi said. Shikaku was thinking about this man that has Iwa and the criminal underworld scared and muttered troublesome. I believe that the Ryushi Juti is real Hiyashi San Shibi San. The Nara clan head said while Inoichi looks at his teammate in shock as do the other clan heads. Troublesome. Let me explain. The Ryushi Juti was, said, to have appeared about three years ago killing a group of missing Iwa Nin and pirates who raided a porting village in river country but after that he disappears. A couple of months after that, a lot of missing Nin's bodies appear at the borders of each country with their heads missing and their bodies torn to ribbons. Also it's possible that the man doesn't leave anything behind to prove that he exists. No tracks, clothing, damaged weapons, nothing. It's like he vanishes once he gets a job done and makes sure no one can find him. Kinda like a ghost. Another reason he does this is because he knows that every single village or organization will want him on their side and doesn't want to deal with that since he doesn't want to be tied to a village. It would not only ruin his line of work, but it'll be easier for his enemies to find and kill him. He'd probably beat me in a game of shogi. He o-planed while everyone took in his explanation. What Shikaku speaks is true. The Ryushi Juti is indeed real. Said a voice from the window. Tsunade turned her head to see her former teammate leaning against the wall. Jiraiya, how long have you been here? Tsunade asks. For a while. If I were you Haim I wouldn't try to see Anbu after him. I would try that once and ended up losing 35% of their Anbu and Hunter Nin. They were all brought back to Iwa's borders with their heads missing and their bodies torn to shreds. The Toad Sage said with a grim look on his face. Why you're kidding? He destroyed a small fraction of Iwa's forces like that. He must be at least Sanin or Cage level to be able to pull that off. Soom said with a look of awe on her face. I kid you not. If he's strong enough to do that, then our Anbu will be no match for him. I doubt if I could take him on and live. 
I might injure him but it'll cost me my life. I would recommend not provoking him at least until we get more info on him. He said. Tsunade nodded. Then it's settled. We will not go after the Ryushijuti until we have more info on him. If I find out that any of you have sent Anbu to find him I will have you thrown in jail and stripped of your positions. She ordered while glaring at the elders. She gets up and leaves the office, hoping that this legendary hunter does not come to Konoha. Oh Kami, did you see who got Seta and Jira? Who was that guy? Kiji asked. I I think that was the Ryushi Juti hunter god. He said while Yatsuki and Karatsuki eyes widen in horror and looked at him. Why you're kidding? Th that man is a myth, a scary story kids are told. Karatsuki started to sweat like crazy. There's no Ryushi Juti here. You guys got worked up over no, what? Those were his last words when his body jerked backwards and was embedded into a tree branch with a black arrow lodged into his head. Kuratsuki screamed in horror when she saw her teammate's body hang on the branch with a look of shock on his face before he died. Why you? I it can't be. You can't be real. You just can't. He cried out in horror. The Ryushi Juti narrows his yellowish orange red tinted slitted eyes at the man while three more shadowy figures that appeared to be reptilian approached the man and growled at the trapped Iwan Nin who was trembling in fear and sweating bullets. You're not worthy to die by my hand. Instead I'll let my friends here deal with you. They haven't had a decent meal for a while and I'm sure they would enjoy tearing you apart. He replies in a dark tone while the raptors snarled, revealing razor sharp teeth and saliva dripped from their mouths. Enjoy your meal my Shiryu Hanryo, hunting partners. The Ryushi Juti replied and walked away. The raptors grinned at the whimpering Nin. They then roar and leap down into the ditch and started to rip their meal apart. Kiji's blood-curdling screams echoed through the tropical forest due to the fact that he's being eaten alive by the ultimate predators. Bandit camp near the borders of Kaminari no Kuni and Hai no Kuni. Two unmasked Anbu from Konoha were tied up in a tent with all their weapons and armor gone leaving them in sleeveless shirts and black pants. They had bruises, cuts and a black eye on their beautiful faces. One appeared to be twenty and had red markings on her faces, long brown hair that had a few bangs and was tied into a ponytail. She was Hana Inazuka, the other female appeared to be twenty-four and had long purple hair that stopped to her mid-back and ivory-colored skin. She was Yugo Azuki. Both her and Hannah were returning back to Konoha after completing an assassination mission. They were exhausted from the mission and were attacked and captured by two missing nin from Kumo and Iwa. They were the Kuma Ishi, Stone Bear, and the Shishi Hekareki, Thunder Lion, missing nin from Kumo and Iwa, wanted for the kidnapping and raping of women both civilian and Kunoichi. They were stripped of their weapons and thrown in a tent where they'd be, used, for stress relief. They also saw a bunch of other missing nin that had women in cages who were crying and begging for help while the men just laughed at them. They got smaked around for a while and then the two left the tent. Hannah had a few broken ribs and swore that she could smell blood which was flowing down the side of her hair. Same with Yugo. The Inazuka heiress groaned in pain as she turned over to Yugo who was coughing up blood and spat. D damn it. I swear if I get out of this I'll castrate those bastards. She said but winced in pain as she heard a rib pop. Kuso. My ribs. Hannah nods but was too weak to talk. She knew that they would not get out of this and they'd be raped and killed once they're no longer needed. She was cursing inwardly. She'll never see her Ka-san, brother, partners, friends, family or clan again and worse she was gonna have her innocence taken from her by a rapist. When these thoughts came to her mind she couldn't help but have tears fall from her eyes. Yugo saw this and couldn't help but feel sorry for her. It seems life is cruel after all. She said bitterly while Hannah was sobbing quietly. Outside of the tent and in the camp, the missing nin and bandits were drinking, laughing and harassing the women they caught who were in cages. Meanwhile two figures in the shadows with yellowish orange colored eyes were watching this from the trees. Those pigs. Who do they think they are treating women as if they were playthings? I swear none of them will leave this forest alive. Kasumi snarled trying to keep herself from charging into the camp. Naruto wanted to do the same. He already had summoned raptors around the area and near the camp. I know Kasumi. Wait a minute. He said as he saw a missing IWA nin open a cage and drag a female out. Come on bitch. He snarled as he dragged the kicking and screaming woman into the forest. 
Naruto narrowed his eyes. Stay here Emo Udo, I'll deal with that scum. He says getting a nod from her and vanishes. In the forest, the Iwa Nin was swearing as he dragged the kicking and screaming woman through the forest. He had enough and grabbed her by the collar and slapped her. The woman had short brown hair and gray eyes. She yelped as she fell onto the ground. The Iwa Nin grinned and unzipped his pants revealing his erect member. The woman looks at him with horror and fear in her eyes. Don't worry, you'll enjoy this you slut, he said. The Iwa Nin was about to make his way towards the frightened woman until his body jerked. He looked down to see a blade that was coated with his blood going through his chest. He coughed up blood as the blade was twisted and removed from his body and the Nin fell to the ground and remained motionless. The woman looked up to see a masked hooded figure with yellow-orange slitted eyes staring down at her with what looked like a hilt-less sword with cutouts, teeth-like serrations on the front and back, and a piercing point. He then flicks the blood off the sword and sheaves it. The woman whimpered and curled up into a ball when he walked towards her and knelt down. Are you all right? He asked in a concerned tone. She just looks at him for a while and nods. Good, now go. There's a town not far from here. You should be able to get shelter. He said and got up only for her to reach out and grab his arm. Thank you, she said and kisses him on the cheek and runs off. Naruto sighs and then leaps into the trees while a raptor's head appears from a bush and grabs the dead nin by the head with its teeth and drags it away. Kasumi was watching another nin urinate in a bus and she pulls out a black combat knife. She lands behind him and before he could react, she shoves the knife into his groin hard. He was about to let a scream but she covered his mouth with her hand and jerks his head to the left hard, snapping his neck. He falls to the ground and gets dragged away by another raptor. Kasumi wipes the knife off with a leaf and leaps back into the trees. Naruto was making his way through the tree brooches and stops when he sees four Iwa Chunin guarding a cage that had five women in M. He pulls the same blade out and leaps off the tree and grabs a branch with his left arm and swings around it once and lands on it. He then leaps off it and into the air and descends towards his targets with the sword raised. One Chunin looks at his shadow and sees it get bigger he then looks up into the air to see a hooded figure come down at him with a blade raised and gets sliced in half by Naruto as he lands in a crouching position, causing the women who saw it scream. The other Chunin doesn't even a chance to react when Naruto removes his head from his shoulders. He stabs the other Chunin through the heart and leaves his blade embedded in his body and grabs a Chunin who tried to escape and alert the others by his collar pulls him forward and knees him hard in the spine which snapped in two ending his ability to walk. The nin tries to scream out in pain only to have his mouth covered by Naruto's hand who pulls out a survival knife and slits his throat. Blood seeps out of the gash from his neck and the Iwa nin's eyes rolled up into his sockets and dies. He sheaves his knife and walks towards the still shocked Chunin who still had the blade in his heart. R. Ryushi Juti, was all he said when Naruto yanks his blade out hard causing blood to fly off and decapitates him. The headless body falls to the ground and the head rolls around for a second then stops. He then walks over to the cage that had five girls in it and rips the lock off the door and opens it. Go! Was all he said and vanishes in a blur. The women waste no time and run before more came. Five large Komodo dragons appeared from the bushes and dragged the carcasses away to eat. Kasumi just took down two Junin and three Chunin with what looked like a Naginata with the head of a dragon that had its mouth opened and was holding the silver blade. She then seals it back into a seal she had on her wrist and then runs over to a bush, pulls her mask down over her mouth and vomits. She then coughs a few times and breathes slowly. Naruto then appears beside her and rubs her back slowly. You alright? He asks her and she nods as she puts her mask back on over her face. Let's get this over with. I've already stabbed and castrated half of them in the groin and if I have to do it again I'm gonna lose it. Kasumi mumbles while Naruto chuckles. Well then let's finish this. He says while two raptors appear in front of them. They were six feet tall and weighed 200 pounds. One was a reddish orange color with black stripes all over and a white underbelly. Its eyes were orangish red and had slitted pupils. Razor sharp teeth were in its mouth and also had pitch black claws on its arms and feet and white spiky quills started from its head to the back of its neck. The other one was white with greenish black stripes and green slitted eyes. Inform the others to get ready to attack the camping site when I do that jutsu but don't harm the females. 
Naruto ordered. The two raptors growl lowly and nod then vanish into the forest. Let's get started, he said and performs two hand seals. Kuridakur no jutsu, hidden mist technique. He muttered in a low voice. Meanwhile the Kuma Ishi, Stone Bear, and the Shishi Hekareki, Thunder Lion, Guro and Majima walked into the tent where Hana and Yugo were in and grinned with lust in their eyes. Guro was bald and wore a brown flak jacket with no shirt and brown pants. He had three scars going down the right side of his face. Majima had wild spiky short hair and wore an outfit similar Goro's only he wore a grey flak jacket and pants and a black shirt. You two put up one hell of a fight when we brought you in. Guro said as he leered at Hannah who was shivering as he kneeled down next to her and traced his hand from her neck to her chest and stopped there and squeezed it. Hannah whimpered when he did that while he chuckled. Yugo whose face was cupped by Majima glared at the man with all the hate she could muster. You shouldn't glare cutie. That look makes you appear ugly. Come on let's see a smile on that pretty face. He said only for her to spit saliva and blood on his face. He wipes it of his face and a look of rage appears on his face. He smacks Yugo hard, making her fall to the ground face first he then kicks her in the ribs making her hiss out in pain. You bitch, I tried being nice but now you're gonna get put in your place and that is as a slave you fucking whore. He sn arls and turns her on her back. Guro was laughing at this and grabbed Hannah by her hair getting a hiss of pain out of her and pulls her to his eye level with an evil smile on his face. I'm gonna enjoy fucking you in Azuka. I got these scars from your bitch of a mother and I've hated your clan ever since. I think I'll have you suck me off first. He says and forces her on her knees while he unzips his pants and pulls out his erect member. Hannah's eyes widen in fear. If you bite me you're dead. He growled and started to bring her head closer to his member while she struggles to move her head away from him while tears fell from her eyes. Majima forced Yugo legs opened and he was smiling like a madman. I hope you're a screamer when she said and started to undo her pants. Meanwhile a mist surrounds the camp shocking everyone. What the hell? Where did this mist come from? Aiwa Chunin asked while everyone got up and looked around. A deep dark chuckle surrounded the area and so did a bunch of growls and snarls. You fools dare to enter my forest and defile women for your sick pleasures. Unforgivable. Either Ryushi Juti will make you pay for your transgressions. He said while releasing killer intent causing them to freeze up and sweat like crazy. Oh oh Kami. The Ryushi Juti. We're dead we're all dead. And Iwa Nin whimpered. That's when a bunch of red, green, yellow and orange slitted eyes appeared throughout the mist. Now my Ryushis, hunters, kill them. Let their flesh satisfy your hunger. He roared, making them all go pale as the eyes roared at his command and attacked while their screams echoed through the campsite while the females hugged each other and covered their eyes while the sounds of screaming and flesh being ripped apart was heard. In the tent Guro and Majima were about to claim their prize when the sounds of roaring and screaming was heard. What the hell is that? Guro said as he turned his head to the entrance of the tent. Hannah decided to use this distraction to her advantage. She bared her fang and used what little strength she had to force herself to her feet and sank her fangs into the surprised man's collarbone and getting the taste of blood in her mouth. Guro cried out in pain and ended up stumbling backwards out of the tent and they both fell outside. Guro, Majima asked. Yugo saw this distraction and without warning she pushed herself forward and headbutted the man hard in the face. The sound of cartilage breaking entered her ears and Majima screamed out in pain while clutching his face. Yugo the sprung to her feet, charged at the man and shoulder tackled him out of the tent. The Kumo Nin went flying out of the tent still holding his nose and Yugo hit the ground hard and cried out in pain as three of her ribs snapped and her right shoulder dislocate. She got up still ignoring the pain she was in right now. She was going to kill this bastard if it was the last thing she did. Majima got up slowly. Yugo then leapt into the air behind Majima and wrapped her legs around his head. The weight from her body brought them both down and she tightened her grip on his neck while he struggled to pry her legs off his neck. I'm going to snap your neck you son of a bitch. She cried while his legs flopped around wildly like a fish. Hannah was on top of Guro with her canines inserted deeply into his collar bone. Blood squirted out as she twisted and dug her teeth into his flesh. Her eyes were slitted like her mother's and her appearance was more feral. If she died, she'll die fighting even if she could only use her teeth to fight. 
Ah get the fuck off me you bitch. Guro cried out as they rolled around the ground but she still kept her grip firm. I said get off you fucking bitch. He yelled and started to punch her on the top of her head continuously. Hannah grunted but still kept her grip on him. After a couple of hits her head started to bleed more and her grip started to get weaker and her vision weaker. You damn bitch get off now. He yelled and kicked her hard in the ribs. Her eyes widened from the pain and she let out an ear-splitting scream while flying into the air and hitting the ground hard. Yugo heard this and had a look of worry on her face. Majima took this chance and grabbed one of her ankles and sent electric currents through her body. Yugo let out a scream of agony as volts of electricity coursed through her body frying her from the inside out. She releases her grip, rolls away, and curls up in pain as smoke rose from her body. Guro got up slowly and created an earth spear out of his right arm and walked towards Hannah with a look of insanity in his eyes. Fuck being my bitch, you're better off dead, he says and brings it up to the air while Hannah was coughing up blood and trying to breathe at the same time. Die. He roared and brought the spear down intending on running her through the head but a silver blade went through his heart making his body pause. Then it fell backwards, hitting the ground with a thud. A redhead with a mask covering half of her face appeared and walked towards the body of the stone bear and removed her naginata from the body and severed his head. She then sealed it and the body into a scroll. Well that was fun, she said sarcastically but then saw a female with markings on her face coughing up blood and having trouble breathing. Kasumi's eyes widened and she ran towards her and knelt down. She also removed the rope she was tied in. Majima now had her hoisted in the air by her throat and was cutting off her air supply. He then slammed her onto the ground and then slammed his foot down onto her chest causing her to yell out in pain. He grinned like a madman as he added more pressure to her chest making tears fall out of her eyes from the pain she was in. So you finally broke huh? Good, he raised his foot off of her and pulled a sledgehammer from the seal in his arm and raised it high. Enjoy your new life in hell. He roared until he heard the sound of electricity and the sounds of an eagle crying. Washi Ise, eagles cry. A voice cried out as he plunged his yellow lightning covered hand through the man's back and out of his chest cavity. Blood fell from Majima's mouth as the hand tore out of the man's body and the sickening sound of flesh and bone being ripped was heard. Yugo looked up at her savior and saw him with a hood and mask covering half of his mouth and saw a few strands of blonde hair. He pulls out a strange black sword and severs the head of the missing nin and seals it in the body away. He then stares down at her with his yellow-orange slitted eyes. He then sheathes the sword and walks towards her. She tries to sit up but falls back down in pain. Naruto kneels down cuts her free from the rope, and looks at her. Your right shoulder is dislocated. I'm gonna put it back in place, he said. Yugo nodded and watches as he places his right hand on her shoulder and his left hand on her arm. He then places a firm grip on her shoulder and pushes it in fast and hard. Ah, goddamn it that shit hurts, Yugo yelled. Naruto then placed one arm under her leg and the other one on her back and carefully lifted her up holding her bridal style. WH what are you doing? She asked with a tint of pink on her cheeks due to the fact that she could feel the muscle from his arms. Helping you up, you have three cracked ribs and if you try to walk they'll puncture your lung. He answered getting in, oh, from her while walking towards Kasumi whose hands were glowing white, trying to heal Hannah who was breathing slowly. Will she be alright? Yugo asked while Kasumi nods without looking at her. Hi. She will soon but her lungs have been punctured by some broken ribs. She also has a small crack on the left side of her skull and a broken collarbone. We have to take her back to our place to treat her thoroughly. Kasumi answered. Naruto performed one-handed seals and finished them at the ram seal. The raptors had just finished with their meals and were now leaving the bloody camp. Kasumi stopped healing Hannah and went to free the women. After that, she helped Hannah up who winced in pain. Kasumi hold on and don't let go he said, as a yellow aura surrounded them and they vanished. Meanwhile, an Anbu with a hawk mask saw this and shunshined away oh and formed the Hokage. Underground Uzumaki Compound Recovery Room. Yugo slowly opened her eyes and found herself in a bed with a cover on top of her. She had some patches and bandages on her face and her forehead was wrapped as well. She lifted the covers and found herself wearing a purple robe. She then sits up carefully and sees that her arms, legs, and torso were bandaged also. 
The room was pure white and there were different kinds of paintings in the room. Yugo then looks around to see Hannah who had bandages on her as well and was sleeping softly. Where are we? The last thing I remember is disappearing from that camp and appearing in front of a compound before passing out. She thought but then heard footsteps. She looks at the door only to see a 14-year-old girl with red hair and bluish-green eyes walk in with a tray with two bowls on it. She also had canines jutting from her upper lip. She was also wearing a sleeveless tank top shirt that hugged her body and showed off her figure which seemed to be more developed than other 14-year-old girls. She also wore crimson red pants and black ninja sandals. She blinks at Yugo a few times then smiles. So you're finally awake. That's good she said with a kind voice. The Anbu captain nodded but looked at her in shock. So you were the girl who works with the Ryushi Juti, huh? Kasumi nods and walks forward and sets the tray down. Yes that was me, she answered causing Yugo's eyes to bulge. B but you're so young, she stammered while Kasumi sat in a chair. So, my brother is stronger and he's only three years older than me, she stated while Yugo's mouth hung open. Th the Ryushi Juti is your brother and he's only three years older than you. Yugo asked. Kusumi nods but laughs at the expression on her face. Yeah he is. I don't see how you find it so hard to believe. I mean your village did have an Anbu captain who was 13 when he joined. Kusumi says and Yugo couldn't help but agree but then a serious expression appeared on her face. Why did you save us? She asked with a tone that sounded like a demand but froze when Kusumi gave her an icy glare. It was either save you or let those bastards rape you and those women they caught. The Ryushi Juti may be feared throughout the elemental nations, but he's not heartless. There are only a few things he hates and they are traitors, criminals, perverts and rapists. She said straining the word. He'd kill anyone who would think of raping another person especially females. After all he did stop that slave trade that the Yakuza had in ocean country and also killed the main bosses who started it so if I were you, I wouldn't jump to conclusions. No wonder he hates Konoha, she said while Yugo looks down in shame but then her eyes widened. Wait, why does he hate Konoha? What did we ever do to him? She asked. You misunderstood me Anbu-san, it's not Konoha he hates but the people who run the village. He stated that the ones who run the village are arrogant, short-minded, corrupt, and power-hungry fools who'd stab each other in the back because they trust no one. Kasumi replied which caused Yugo to protest. That's not true. Not everyone in Konoha is like that. The Hokage is an honorable and respected person. She'd never stoop to being corrupt. Kasumi sighed. Again you misunderstood me. I wasn't referring to the Hokage. I was referring to Konoha's council. I mean it's their fault that the village is suffering right now due to the fact that they banished a ninja who not only saved the countries you were tied to but also because he failed to bring back a traitor who had a bloodline and went to an even bigger traitor. But what's worse about it is that he was banished for containing a biju but not just any biju, the Kayubi no Kitsune. Is that true or not? She asked in an icy tone. Yugo flinched at her words and looked at the sheets of her bed. It is true. A lot of countries are disgusted with what we did even the ones who had jinchurikis. The fire daimyo is also disappointed with us and punished us for our actions towards the boy. Only 20% of us respected the yandaimi's wish but the rest, well you know. I held no hatred for the boy and was even his bodyguard when he was little. He was the barrier that protected us from the Kayubi's wrath and those fools nearly destroyed it. She said while clenching her fists. I just hope that he's living a great life now that he doesn't have to look over his shoulder in fear anymore. She said with a sad smile on her face. Kasumi just looks at her and her expression softens. She looks over to see Hannah groaning and opening her eyes. Why the hell does my head hurt so much? Feels like my skull was smashed in with a rock. She said and tilts her head and sees Yugo and a red-headed female looking at her. Yugo who is that and where are we? She asked and sat up but groaned in pain. Kami my ribs hurt, she whined getting a giggle from Yugo who also winced since her ribs hurt too. Kasumi chuckles but then gets up from the chair to get the two bowls of stew she had and walked over to Yugo's bed and handed her one. Thank you, she said while Kasumi walked over to Hana and gave her the other bowl. Thanks uh, Kasumi, glad you're still with us in Azuka-san, she replied while Hana gave her a small smile. Just call me Hana Kasumi, 
She replied getting a nod from the girl. Do you have any aspirin? My head is killing me. Hannah asked while the redhead pulls a bottle out of her pocket and hands it to her. Thank you, she says, popping the bottle off with her thumb and puts toe in her mouth then swallows them. She the grabs the spoon that was in the stew and scoops it up. She puts the spoon into her mouth and slurps the stew off and swallows it. Her eyes widen from the taste. Oh Kami this is great, she said and eats more of it. Yugo does the same and her eyes widen as well. Oh wow my taste buds are dancing. Did you make this? She asked while Kasumi shakes her head. No my brother did, she answered getting shocked looks from them. Your brother cooks? Hannah asked, shocked that a male could actually cook. Yep, he can practically cook anything from scratch. He can also clean, sow, garden, and can also make his own clothes. He's much better than mom because he doesn't leave holes in my pants. She said with a small blush on her face while Hannah and Hugo's eyes were the size of dinner plates. Hannah returned to normal and asked, Is he close to my age and is he single? She asked with stars in her eyes. Hannah, Hugo yelled out but also couldn't help but want wander the same thing. You know for two women who had just recovered, you sure do have loud voices. Said a blonde male who walked in the recovery room. He was six feet zero and wore a black sleeveless muscle shirt that hugged his body like a second skin, showing off his chest and abs as well as his arms that were muscular but not overly muscled. He also had tattoos that looked like black claw marks on his right arm. His mask was gone, showing off his masculine face. He also had canines jutting from his upper lip and had deep blue slitted eyes and his hairdo was similar to the Yondimis but he had red highlights in his bangs. He also wore black Anbu cargo pants with two belts around his waist and Anbu styled sandals that stopped near his knees. Yugo and Hannah couldn't help but blush at the blonde male's appearance. Wrapped around his neck was what looked like a blackish brown scarf but it was actually a ferret. Kasumi looked at her brother and sighs. A red blur zips past Naruto and leaps onto Kasumi's shoulders and licks her cheek getting a giggle from the girl. It was Benihime. Benny chan did you miss me? Kasumi asked the two-tailed kid who yipped and nuzzled her cheek while she scratched her behind the ear. Naruto groans while the ferret unwraps herself from his neck and leaps off his shoulder and lands on Yugo's lap. Yugo stopped ogling Naruto and looked down at the ferret that stared at her with her silver-gray eyes and squeaked while tilting her head to the side. The female swordsman had to suppress a kawaii when it looked at her. The ferret then crawled up her arm and onto her shoulder, and then licked her face. Ah she likes you Yugo, Hannah said but was inwardly fuming because she wanted the ferret to lick her face also. Yugo let out a giggle and rubbed her finger under the ferret's neck gently. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this. Wow, I've never seen Hanon act like that with a stranger before. He said while Hanon snuggled into Yugo's arm and purred when she stroked her back. Hannah was pouting at this and wanted to hold the cute ferret. Kasumi saw this and giggled. Benihime leapt off of her shoulder and ran to Hannah's bed and laid in her lap, shocking the girl. She then stroked the fox's ears and she purrs. Why does this fox have two tails? Hannah asked and Naruto answers. She was born with them. Her mother had three tails though. She won't gain it until she turns two. Benihime looks at him and glares. Don't give me that look fox. You know I'm right, he says while she yips at him and lays her head back down. Cranky fox. Anyway, I'm afraid you two will have to stay here for a while. Your injuries were very serious when we rescued you especially yours Hannah. Three of your ribs snapped and punctured your lungs which caused some serious internal bleeding. You also had a crack in your skull and a nasty gash was on the back of your head. Kasumi managed to stop the internal bleeding but we had to pull the broken ribs that were in your lung carefully and then had to regenerate the cells in it. Your ribs will take two weeks to heal and your skull will take a couple of days but you'll suffer from minor headaches for a while so try not to think too much. He said in a joking matter only to get smacked upside the head by another red head that walked in wearing a black mesh shirt and red pants. Don't be a smart ass Sochi. She said while Naruto rubbed his head. Yugo's eyes widened when she saw the woman who she thought died. KK Kashina Sensei. She asked while Kashina looked at her then smiled. She walked over to Yugo who had tears form in her eyes until the Uzumaki was a few inches away from her. Hey Yu-chan, it's been a while, she said. 
Yugo pulled her master into a hug and sobbed into her shoulder. Kashina returned it and rubbed her back with her hand. Hana's eyes widened. She was looking at Kashina Uzumaki, the aka Rashi and strongest Kunoichi who was on par with Tsunade. Yugo and Kashina released each other. Sensei I thought you died when the Kyubi attacked. She said while wiping her eyes with her sleeve while Kashina shook her head. No I didn't I left because Serutobi told me that my son died. She said saying Serutobi with venom in her voice. Hannah blinked in confusion. Wait you had a son. Who was he and who was the father? She asked and that's when Naruto walked up. Me, can you guess who my father was? Naruto asked while Yugo and Hannah looked at him and their eyes became big. And no way, you're the son of the Yandaimi. Oh Kami, Konoha banished his son. What have we done? Hana said with a look of dread on her face. Naruto just chuckles. Imagine the village's surprise when they find out that I'm not only the Yandaimi's son but the Ryushi Juti. He said while their jaws dropped to the ground. You're the Ryushi Joutei. Yugo yelled while Nato nodded. Yep, so who is she sensei? Yugo asked pointing to the 14-year-old. My daughter Kasumi. I had her with I got remarried to another man. He's not here right now. He went to Kiri to deal with some pirates that were raiding the docks. Kashina answered. Now that we know who you really are what's going to happen to us? Hana asked hoping that Naruto won't kill them. Nothing. Once you're healed up you're free to go. It doesn't matter to us. Kona has no threat to me or my family and we can deal with any ninja that comes from there. He answered and walked over to Kasumi and placed his hand on her head. Kasumi here is on par with Hitaki Tem and can take on two Anbu units without breaking a sweat. He replied while she I smiled. Sorry but I won't tell you how strong I am. That was when a raptor appeared in front of Naruto, growling and chirping. Said blonde's eyes widen and they narrow. How many? He asked while the raptor chirped. Damn. Ka san I'll be back. We appear to have some. Guests. In our jungle. He said and walks out of the room while the raptor disappears in a puff of smoke. Naruto who is it? Kashina asks. Naruto turns around with a dark look on his face. Konoha nin. He answers while his eyes went from deep blue to yellow orange. Kashina's eyes widen and her eyes narrow. Take Kasumi with you and deal with them. Try not to kill them though. Break em in half if you must. She said while Naruto nodded. Let's go Kasumi. We have trash to throw out. Naruto called out and his emotu ran out of the room saying, Hi, and runs past him to get her gear. Naruto then walks into the dark tunnel as well while his eyes glowed in the dark. Meanwhile, several Konoha nin were running through the dark dense jungle. They were Asuma, Gai, Anko, Kurenai, Kakashi, Neji, Kiba and Akamaru. Their mission was to search for Yugo and Hana who were reported to have been abducted by the Ryushi Juti and his partner by an Anbu. Tsunade had no choice but to send them to try to retrieve them or listen to the council bitching about it. Kakashi however was still a chunin despite the elder's protest but the senju wouldn't hear it stating that he abused his position and needs to be humbled. His colleagues heard about the thrashing he got from Kurenai after what he said and didn't feel sorry for the man. They just ignored him and didn't invite him for drinks or any other things they did on their downtime. Enko also gave the Cyclops a thrashing he'd never forget. They continued to run until Asuma stopped as did the others. They heard growling. What that hell was that? Enko asked. Don't know, but I've never heard something growl like that. Kiba sniffed the air and got stiff. Whoever growled like that is reptilian. The Inazuka replied. Neji activated his Byakugan to try and find the source. That odd. My Byakugan isn't picking up any heat signatures. They must be capable of lowering their body temperatures. He said as he increased his vision but still got nothing. Great, so we do not know if they're a threat or not. Kakashi asked while Guy pulls out two black tonfas. Get ready for a fight everyone. Whatever Kiba and Akamaru sensed are close by. He said in a serious tone. Asuma pulled out his trench knives. Kiba flexed his claws and Akamaru's fur stood up. Neji got into a Jukan stance with his Byakugan activated. Enko pulled out two kanai as did Kurenai and Kakashi. Suddenly, a bunch of red, yellow, orange, and green eyes appeared around them growling from the tropical plant life. One leapt out of the plant life that hid them and landed a couple of feet away from them. The Junin had looks of shock, 
fear, and awe when they saw the reptilian creature stand before them hissing. It was six feet tall, thirteen feet long and weighed around two hundred pounds. Its skin tone is a blackish-brown color, had a two light blue stripes starting from its neck to the end of its tail and was white on the creature also had a crest on the middle of its nose that was red and it had feather quills on the back of its head that stopped to the end of its neck. Its red slitted eyes stared the Junin down it also had a long thick tail that it could probably be used for combat, but that's not what got their attention. On its long arms were three pairs of long black curved claws that appeared to be razor sharp and on its feet were three claws but the third one was longer and stood straight up and looked like it could cut a person open with a mere twitch. The creature then snarled and opened its maw, revealing a pair of razor sharp teeth that could tear through flash as if it were paper. Every Junin had wide eyes when they looked at it. What kind of animal is that? Kurinai asked while the raptor started to walk left and right in a slow fashion while eyeing his new prey. Saliva dripped from his mouth and his hisses grew louder. Who knows? But something tells me that we're on in its menu. Neji replied. Akamaru tensed up more and growled at the bushes. Fourteen more of them came out of hiding, hissing and snarling at their new prey while approaching them slowly flexing their claws and snapping their teeth a few times. Some were dark brown with green slitted eyes, others were whitish gray with blackish brown spots and yellow slitted eyes, and the rest were orange with tiger-like stripes and orange slitted eyes. Shit, this doesn't look good, Asuma said while increasing his grip on his trench knives. Anko grinned at them and licked her lips. I wonder if I can keep one as a pet. The snake mistress replied getting a glare from Kurinai. This isn't a time time to joke around Anko. Kurinai said while Anko chuckled. Who said I was kidding? Anko answered back while the others got ready. What are they waiting for? Kiba asked Neji. For their leader to order the attack. They're not just animals Kiba. They're smart. They're a pack who works as a team like we do. I suggest we keep our distance from them. Their claws and teeth prove that they're proficient in close combat which is bad for most of us. The Hyuga answered. Kiba snorted. So what? They're a bunch of overgrown lizards. I doubt they could take on an Inazuka. He said arrogantly. The leader heard this and his eyes flared and he snarled loudly at the two-legged mammal. How dare that ninjin mock us? I'm gonna enjoy ripping him apart. He ranted in his mind. He then lets out a roar and charges at the ninjin who mocked him. Oh shit he's coming for me. Kiba cried out as the predator moved at a speed that seemed impossible for a creature its size. Guy moved between the raptor and Kiba and swung the tonfa he had in his right arm at him. To everyone's surprise it leapt over Guy who was also shocked, landed on the ground, and still charged at the frightened Inazuka with its maw opened wide and its claws ready to rip him apart. Before he could do that Anko delivered a roundhouse kick to the leader's side and sent him tumbling on the ground. Anko glared at Kiba who had the nerve to look sheepish. Don't get why you mutter next time I'll let him rip you apart. Anko said in a scary voice. The leader got back up on his feet and roared. The other roared back and charged at their new prey. Anko and the leader stared each other down. He growled at the scantily clad Kunoichi who just smiled which confused yet irritated the raptor. They circled each other, waiting for one to attack. The raptor just hissed and flexed his claws while Anko's grin became predatory. The leader then charged at Anko who had her two kunai ready and started snapping at her head. Anko dodged them and after the fifth one, she kicked the hunter in its lower jaw, causing him to stagger back a little. He shook his head to get the stars out of his head and saw the snake mistress charge at him and swing one of her kunai at his throat. He moved sideways and snapped at her side but she twisted her body and punched him on the side of his head. The raptor grunts a little from the punch but couldn't help but be impressed with this ninja's strength. Too bad he had to kill her. The ancient predator swung its large tail at the women who leaps over the attack and lands on the ground. The raptor then swipes at Anko's back with his claws and she barely dodges them. Her trench coat gets shredded from the bottom though. She looks down her ruined coat and glares at the raptor. You damn lizard, this is my favorite coat. I'll take your hide as compensation. She yelled and charged at the raptor who roared back and charged towards her. While the Konoha Nin were taking on the pack, Two dark figures with yellow-orange eyes were watching the fight. It appears our friends have found the rotten leaves. Let's go Kasumi, he said as he draws his katana from his back as does she. The Konoha Junin were currently engaging in battle with the pack of raptors that ambushed them earlier. 
Guy was engaging two of them. The one on his right side snapped at his head but he ducks and uppercuts the creature in its lower jaw, and then kicked him in the chest hard, sending it flying and crashing into one that had Kuranai cornered. Kurani looked at Guy and nods a thanks but then her eyes widen. Guy you're left, she cried out as another raptor leapt into the air, heading for Guy who turned managed to sense the creature heading for him and flips away just in time to avoid its claw swipe. The raptor snarls in frustration and glares at Kuranai who was in a defensive stance. The raptor stopped and appeared to be grinning. Kuranai raised an eyebrow and before she could react, another raptor head butted her in the side and sent her crashing into a tree. She groans and tries to get the stars out of her head. Her eyes widen in fear as a raptor appears in front of her with its mouth open and brings its head down. She rolls to the side to avoid having her head bitten off but the raptor then leaps and lands on top of her and brings his open maw down on her again. Kuranai manages to plant her foot on its chest to stop the creature but struggle to keep maw from ripping her face off. The raptor pushes itself forward while growling and Kuranai adds more strength to her foot. D damn it this creature is strong. She thought as saw saliva dripping out of its mouth and landed on the side of her face while she grimaces in diggest. Haya, yelled Anko and the alpha raptor was seen flying towards the one that had Kuranai pinned. He crashes into the other one and they're sent tumbling to the ground. Anko appears beside Kuranai and helps her up. Kuranai took one look at Anko and couldn't help but sigh. Her hair was a mess, her trench coat was torn up, and she had cuts dirt, and slash marks all over her fishnet outfit was especially ruined. Anko what the hell happened to you? She asked while said woman was snorting. Stupid lizard ruined my favorite coat. Look at it, she whined while one of the sleeves fell off and hit the ground. Anko looked down at it and yelled. That does it, that lizard's hide is mine. She screamed and charged at the dazed alpha raptor who just got up as did the other and then got socked in the head hard and was sent flying into a tree and hitting it hard. The Alpha groaned and staggered a little. It snarled at Anko and let out a roar filled with rage. It was about to charge but froze for a bit. He then let out a few chirps and hisses and the other raptors stopped their fighting and ran off into the jungle. The Alpha gave Anko a look and snorted at her. It then retreated back into the jungle while Anko yelled, Same to you pal. Neji was tired and pulled out a chakra pill and ate it as did everyone else. Before anyone could stay anything, a figure leapt into the air and landed onto the ground. Everyone's eyes widened when he stood up slowly. He was 6 feet 0 and 17 years old. He wore a short-sleeved dark blue hooded trench coat and also wore a pair of black cargo pants with Anbu-styled boots. On his upper body he wore a black long-sleeved skin-tight muscle shirt that hugged his body like a second skin and showed off his arms, chest, and abs and had yellow-orange slitted tinted red eyes that radiated power. He also wore a grey-coloured flak jacket that was zipped up and had extra pockets on them and a collar. He also wore a black mask that covered half of his face and a pair of long blonde spiky bangs that were crimson at the ends but stopped to the sides of his face. He also had on black fingerless gloves that had metal plates on them and also wore arm guards on his arms. Strapped to his back was a black katana. The hilt was black and had five holes and a silver metal tip at the end. The guard was silver and the sheath was black, snake eyes blade from G. I. Joe Rise of the Cobras. He also had two strange knives strapped to the back of his belt as well as two on his right and left leg. He glared at the Konoha Nin and released murderous intent that was on par with Asanin's, making it difficult for them to breathe, especially Neji and Kiba who never felt this much in their life. What are you Konoha Nin doing in my territory? He asked in a dark tone that sent a shiver down their spine. Even Anko was shivering when she looked into this man's eyes she saw her death. Akamaru was whimpering and shaking from the glare. Asuma, Guy, and Kakashi had beads of sweat drip from their face. W were her to retrieve two of our ninja Ryushi Juti. We didn't come here looking for trouble. Asuma said hoping that he wouldn't attack but the man just stares at him blankly. As that's so, well I'm sorry to say that I can't hand them over. He answered getting shocked looks from them. What? Anko yelled and was about to charge until Kurnai grabbed her arm. Anko looked at her and saw the Genjutsu mistress shake her head. You bastard give me back my sister. Kiba yelled and flexed his claws. Ryushi just looked at the Inazuka and snorted. No, he said making Kiba growl. What did you say? 
he snarled releasing murderous intent on the bounty hunter who just laughs. Is that all you've got? Pathetic. I've faced pirate lords with more intent than the amount you're releasing and I suggest you cut it off or I'll make you. He says as he cracks his gloved hand. Neji sees the look on Kiba's face and responds. Kiba don't act rash. He's antagonizing you to attack him and don't forget we're facing the Ryushi Juti. Not to mention that we're in his territory so calm down. The Hayuga says and looks at the man with his Byakugan but to his shock he can't figure out his. Kiba clenches his fists in frustration. Damn it. Guy then speaks up. Please Ryushi-san. We're just here to get our comrades back. Like my friend Asuma said we're not here to fight you. The spandex wearing ninja said. Naruto stares at the man but chuckles. Like I said to your teammate I won't hand them over. Now leave before I make you. He says getting impatient. I'm not going anywhere until I get Hannah back damn it now either you do it or I'll make you. Kiba roared out loud. Ryushi smirks under his mask. Why don't you make me mutt? I'll be more than happy to kick your sorry ass around the field and back. He says the Inazuka's eyes flash with anger and he then charges at the hooded figure in a blind rage and ignoring the yells of the others telling him to stop. Ryushi smirks while Kiba charges at him. Kiba was about to strike him in the face until Kiba finds himself on the ground with his arms pinned behind his back and feels the cold sharp end of a blade pressed against his neck and freezes. You shouldn't let your emotions cloud your judgment Konohan in. It could get you and your comrades killed said a feminine but dangerous voice. Sitting on top of Kiba with a blade at his throat was a red-headed female who seemed to be around 14 to 15 wearing a mask similar to the Ryushi Judies. Her eyes were bluish-green and slitted. She wore a black cloak over a red and black ninja outfit and strapped to her back was a katana in a red sheath. Asuma cursed at Kiba's actions. Kakahi was about to pull out a kanai and strike Kasumi with it. Keywords were about to but then hunched over and gasped in pain as a fist connected to his gut courtesy to the Ryushi. Bad move, he whispers silently. The bounty hunter then backhanded the nin on the side of his face and sent him flying into Guy who avoided being hit and saw an incoming fist heading for his face and barely blocked it but the strength behind it sent him crashing into a tree. Neji tried to sneak up behind the man and strike him in the back with a Jukan attack, but Ryushi sidestepped the attack shocking the Hayuga and grabbed his wrist. Before Neji could react, Ryushi kneed him in the chest, making him gasp out in pain and then he grabbed him by the face, lifted him into the air and slammed him into the ground hard. Then he ducks to avoid a roundhouse kick from Anko and sweeps kicks her, making the snake mistress hit the ground hard and then twists his body to avoid being slashed by a trench knife and hits Asuma in the gut with an elbow. Asuma grunts in pain as the hunter vanishes in a blur when Akamaru snaps at him with his teeth and appears next to Kasumi. The other nin get up but stop. Don't move or I'll give your friend here a new hole to breathe out of. Kasumi says in a threatening voice, making them tense up. Ryushi however just smirks at them and dusts off his trench coat. I warned you nin not to do anything and now look. We have a hostage, he said while Kasumi punches him in the head to make him stop squirming. Great what do we do now? Anko asks. Asuma sighs in frustration and glares at Kakashi. What the hell were you thinking trying to attack her? She would have slitted Kiba's throat and killed him before your kanai hit its mark. The son of the Sandame growled while the Cyclops flinches. Ryushi chuckles while looking at the Nin. How about a trade-off? I'm willing to hand to Mongrel over but you have to hand those two over. Ryushi says pointing to Anko and Kuranai, getting a shocked look from the Nin. What? Are you serious? Asuma asks getting a nod from the nin. You two are Kuranai Yuhi and Anko Midarashi correct? Ryushi asks while the two women nod slowly. The two nin I have with me now are your friends Hana Inazuka and Yugo Azuki correct? He asked and again they nod. If you wish to see them then you must disarm yourselves and come with us. The rest of you get off my lands. He said while the male's eyes widened. Why should we? Kakashi asks getting another glare from Asuma. Ryushi's eye twitched D and he growled. Because if you don't I'll kill your friend here as well as the rest of you if you don't get the fuck out of here you stupid scarecrow. He growled getting a sneer from Kakashi who was about to speak again but Asuma beat him to it. Shut up Hitaki, you're not making the situation any better. He yelled making the copy nin zip it. Asuma lets out a sigh and looks at Kuranai and Anko. Disarm yourselves and approach him but don't do anything. 
he orders and they reluctantly nod and remove their weapons. They then walk toward Ryushi Juti who pulls out two chakra suppressing cuffs and puts them on the two Kunoichi. Ibo, partner, toss the mutt to them. He says getting a nod from the girl. As soon as she gets up she kicks him between the legs hard getting a girly scream from Kiba while the other males accept the Ryushi wince. Gomen, sorry. She says but not in an apologetic way and tosses him to the male Junin while he holds his puppies in pain. Kasumi pulls out two blind folds and puts them around their eyes. Can't have you knowing the location of our hideout. She says and pushes them forward while Naruto stood in front of her eyeing the other nin. Kakashi looks at Asuma in shock and speaks. Asuma you're not seriously gonna let them take Anko and Kurunai are you? What if they? He starts to say but Asuma glares at the man. We had no other choice because you tried to pull a sneak attack on that girl Kakashi. We could have lost Kiba because of your stupidity and I'm sure as hell not gonna explain to Soom why she lost two of her children. He replies getting a pale look from the Cyclops. Now that they're gone get the hell off my lands before I add your heads to my trophy collection. Ryushi demanded while his eyes glowed dangerously. Asuma motions them to retreat while Asuma stands there staring at the man. No harm will come to them right? He asks while the nin nods. No harm shall come to them. I may be an assassin, but I'm not a cold-blooded murderer and I'm a man of my word. Tell your cage to keep her pets on a leash or else she'll find her ninja forces reduced in half. He says in a harsh tone and vanishes in a flash of yellow light, scaring the Junin. Asuma sighs and rubs his hair back in frustration. Tsunade-sama is not gonna like this. God this sucks, he mutters and then shunshuns away. Meanwhile, a blindfolded Anko and Kurunai were being led through a dark tunnel in an underground lair by Kasumi who had one of their hands in hers. So where the hell are we Gaki? Anko asked and a tick mark appeared on Kasumi's head. I may be a Gaki, but I can still kick your ass Ba-chan. She said while Anko growled. I'll have you know I'm only 25 Gaki. She said while Kurunai sighs. Really, I thought you were at least 30. The redhead replied while Anko's face turned red and was about to retort until Kurunai spoke up. In case you haven't noticed Anko, we're hostages with our chakra sealed so please don't mouth off. She said and Anko mumbles about smartass brats calling her old while Kasumi snickers. Just because you're hostages doesn't mean you're gonna get tortured. Even if you're Kona Hanin. She said getting raised eyebrows from them. As that's so, if you're not gonna torture us what will you do? Anko asks and Kasumi looks at her with an eye smile. First I'm getting you some clothes to wear. You look like a hooker when you wear nothing but a shredded trench coat, a fishnet outfit, and a skirt. Anko's eyebrow twitched and Kurunai had to hold in a giggle that was about to come out. That stupid lizard ruined my coat. She mumbled. Raptor. Kasumi answered getting their attention. A what? Kurunai asks. Those lizards you faced earlier were raptors and they're not lizards. They're actually the ancestors of the bird family. She said like it was no big deal, but Anko's jaw dropped. Are you telling me that I got my ass handed to me by an overgrown featherless turkey? She asked and Kasumi said one word. Yep. Anko hung her head down and sobbed quietly. Kurunai just sweat dropped and then asked a question. If I may ask her Hannah and you go okay. The genjutsu mistress asks. They're doing okay but are recovering from the injuries they got when they were captured and almost raped by the Kuma Ishi, Stone Bear, and the Shishi Hekareki, Thunder Lion. Luckily me and Ryushi killed those bastards. She said with a hint of venom in her voice while Anko and Kurunai gasps. Why you killed them? Anko asks since the missing nin were a class in the bingo and were responsible for the rapes of a lot of females. Yeah, their heads are now trophies hanging on our walls with the other missing nin we killed. Your Nakama's comrades were in bad shape so we brought them here until they fully recover. She finished. And Kurunai spoke up. I always thought that the Ryushi Juti was nothing more than a killer. Kasumi chuckles at that and replies. A lot of people think that. True he is a bounty hunter with a flea on sight order but he's not cold blooded. He just does his job like any other hired merc does but he only goes after those who are corrupt. He'd never kill an innocent person but he without a doubt hates traitors, criminals, and rapists. She said getting raised eyebrows from them. After leading them through the tunnel for 30 minutes, 
Kasumi removes the blindfolds from them and they blink for a while and then slowly open their eyes to see themselves in what looked like an underground tunnel with different paths that lead to God knows where. Okay where the hell are we? She asks while looking around, stay with me and do not wander off or else. Kasumi said in a warning tone. Kurinai looked at her funny and asked, or else what? That was when they heard a thunderous roar echo through the tunnel shaking the ground. Or else you'll end up running into whatever just roared. A voice said behind them. They turned around to see the Ryushi Juti standing behind them carrying a dead wild boar over his shoulder with one hand. Kurinai and Anko noticed that his eyes were now a deep blue cerulean and were slitted and he wore his hood down, revealing wild, spiky blonde, shoulder-length hair that was similar to the Yandaimis. He then looks at Anko and raises an eyebrow. You should really start wearing clothes that aren't so revealing Kunoichi-san. He says in a humorless, making Anko's face turn red. Shut up, she yelled while he shrugs it off. He removes the mask from his face, revealing a pair of canines that jutted from his upper lip. Both Konoha Kunoichi blush when they saw his face. Yandaimi-sama, Kurinai asks while the 17-year-old rolls his eyes. Sorry but I'm not him. Kasumi take this to the preserver room. I'll escort them to where their friends are. Naruto says and tosses the dead boar to Kasumi who catches it but grunts when she hefts it over her shoulder. Damn it Aniki why do you always kill the heavy ones? She cries out while he chuckles. Stop crying you big baby. You know how our old man likes boar meat. He says and watches her leave but mutters about fathers with bottomless pits and brothers being smart asses. Naruto smirks when she disappears and places an arm on Anko's and Kurinai's shoulder, causing them to tense up but relax when gives them a small smirk. Calm down you two, I may hate Konoha but I won't damn the innocent. Come with me and I'll take you to your friends. Ha says in a calm and gentle tone. Anko and Kurinai nod and try to hold in the blushes that were about to form on their faces while Naruto leads them further into the labyrinth. As they walked through the labyrinth Kurinai and Anko kept glancing at the man who was supposed to be a cold-blooded killer who'd kill you if you were his target but he hasn't given them a reason yet to be afraid of him. That's when Kurinai spoke up. Our Ryushi-san, that girl who escorted us into this place called you her Aniki. Are you two siblings? She asked and he nodded. Yes, she's my half-sister on my mother's side. He replied. Anko raised an eyebrow at what he said. Half-sister. So you both have the same mother but different fathers. Again he nodded. My biological father died the day I was born and no I won't tell you who he was. And don't let her appearance fool you. She may be young but she is strong enough to handle three squads of Anbu level nin. Naruto replies while they look at him in shock and could tell that he wasn't joking. Wow. Anyway how bad was Hana and Yugo's condition? Anko asks. Hana I believe had three broken ribs that punctured her left lung a gash on the back of her head as well as a crack on the right side of her skull. Yugo had three broken ribs, a dislocated shoulder, and burns from a lightning jutsu. He says and Kurinai gasps but gets a reassured look from the man. Relax, Maimo Udo managed to heal them but they won't be fighting for a while. Naruto replies and they find themselves near a door that says recovery room. Well here we are, he says and pulls out a key, then removes the cuffs that were around their wrists. Anko and Kurinai rubbed their wrists while Naruto opened the door and lets them walk in first. When the two Kunoichi walked in, they saw a bandaged up Yugo and Hana in a bed petting what looked like a black and brown ferret and a two-tailed fox that were cuddled up in their lap. Anko and Kurinai's eye widened when they saw their two friends were okay. Yugo turned her head to see Anko and Kurinai and her eyes widened in shock. Hana did the same and said, Anko, Kurinai, they asked. The next thing the recovering Kunoichi knew, they were in a bear hug courtesy to Anko and Kurinai. You're both okay. Anko cried out while Yugo's face was turning purple as was Hana's. A Anko-chan please let go my ribs are breaking. Yugo strained while Hana was struggling to breath. A air Kurena chan I n need air. Hana chalked out. Anko and Kurinai noticed what they were doing and released them while smiling sheepishly. Sorry about that. We're just happy to see you're both okay. Kurinai said while Hannah and Yugo smiled. Thanks but try to show it by not crushing our ribs. Hannah said while massaging her sides making them laugh a little. Yugo noticed that Anko's trench coat was shredded and her fishnet suit had claw marks. 
The female swordsman raised an eyebrow and looked at her. Anko what happened to your outfit? She asked and Anko just looked at it and a small blush appeared on her face and she rubbed the back of her head. It's a long story Yu Chan. Anko replied and looks at Ryushi. Speaking of clothes, you wouldn't have any to spare would you? Anko asks while Ryushi pulls out a scroll, unrolls it and in a puff of smoke, there was a black two-piece body suit and a black trench coat. Sorry but I don't carry women underwear on me so you'll have to use the ones you're wearing. He said but then noticed a blush on Anko's face and looks at her with a raised eyebrow. You are wearing underwear under your clothes aren't you? He asks and Anko just looks away from him not saying anything. Hannah sweat drops, Yugo sighs, and Kurenai face faults at her friend's actions but then stands up glaring at the snake user. Anko, Kurenai yells out and the woman looks at her trying to look innocent. What? She says in an innocent tone. Kurenai starts to talk but just lets out a frustrating sigh and shakes her head. Forget it, I'd just be wasting my energy. She mumbles while Anko just grins. You know you love me Nai Chan. She coos out while Kurenai looks at the Ryushi Juti. Would you won't hold it against me if I end up strangling my friend over there? She asks while Anko makes faces behind her back, getting a sweat drop from the hunter. Kurenai turns her head back at Anko who again has the innocent look on her face. Kurenai's row twitched and was gonna go strangle her until she felt something rub against her leg. She looks down and sees a two-tailed fox kid with crimson fur rubbing against her leg. The kid looks up at her with light pink eyes and yips. Kurenai just looks down at the fox and stares at her but on the inside she was squealing kawaii. The genjutsu mistress smiles down at the fox kneels down and scoops the fox up in her arms while the fox yips and starts to lick her face. Kurenai giggles as the fox continues to lick her. She then scratches her behind the ear getting a purr from the fox. Anko was pouting at this. No fair why'd all the cute ones go to Nai-chan first. She whines while Hana and Yugo giggle at this. Naruto chuckles at this then speaks up. I'm pretty sure you two are hungry so I'll bring you some food back. He says and starts to leave. Kurenai was gonna object but her stomach growled out loud causing the ruby-eyed woman to blush in embarrassment. Anko snickered and felt something on her shoulder. She looked and saw a black and brown ferret that squeaked and licked her face. Anko squealed and hugged the furball, nuzzling her cheek against it. She's so kawaii. The snake mistress squealed while the other sweat dropped at this. Kanahagakur no Sato Hokage Tower. What did you just say Asuma Serutobi? Tsunade yelled from her now destroyed desk that was nothing more than firewood. Shizun was curled up in a corner, trembling like and holding a trembling tauntin in her arms and close to her body. Asuma was now gulping and sweating like crazy as he saw the murderous look in Tsunade's eye. Th the Ryushi Juti has Kurenai and Anko H Hokage Sama. I if we hadn't handed them over then his partner would have killed Kiba and us as well. A as the leader of the mission I had no other choice but to do as he said not to mention that he temporarily disabled Guy, Kakashi, and Neji without even trying. He also told me to tell you to keep your ninja in check or he'll see to it that our forces are cut in half. He explained while Tsunade growled out loud, picked up her chair, and threw it out the window, shattering it. She ignored the scream that came from outside and then let out a frustrating sigh. Great, just great. Four of my kunoichi are in the hands of an S-class merc. There's no telling what he's doing to them. Tsunade says but then Asuma speaks up. Actually Hokage-sama I don't believe the Ryushi Juti will harm them. He says while she looks at him with a look that says, explain. Didn't the Anbu who reported this say that him and his partner saved Hana and Yugo from the missing Nin and his partner treated them? If wanted to kill Hana and Yugo, he would have done so a long time ago. He responded while the last Senju looked at the wall and sighs again. True, but what about Kurenai and Anko? They're now his captives and I can't send any more ninja. He'll weaken us and that'll give villages like Iwa an opportunity to attack us. Can this get any worse? She groaned out and that's when an Anbu appears kneeling down to the leader of the village. Hokage-sama, the council wishes to speak with you. He says and shunshins away while Tsunade smacks her head. Why do you hate me Kami-sama? She asks and walks out of her office. Council Chambers. Twenty minutes passed while the council members were arguing about what happened. 
Tsunade heard enough and slammed her fist onto the desk. Shut up, all of you, she yelled and they did. Tsunade lets out a sigh and soon speaks up. Hokage-sama we need to deal with the Ryushi Juti now. He has my eldest daughter as well as three of our Kunoichi captive. Who knows what he's doing to them? She cried out. Yasha just snorts at this. I don't see what the big deal is. They can be replaced. The Haruno matriarch says but ends up getting a glare from the clan heads especially Soom who wanted to rip her apart. I dare you to fucking repeat that Haruno. Soom snarled while the woman paled. Yasha shut up. I didn't ask for your input. Matter of fact the civilians and elders leave. This is a shinobi matter. Tsunade says and ends up hearing them whine and protest to this until Tsunade punches the table. I said get the fuck out. She roared while a vein throbbed from her head and the civilians and elders left out of there and she sighs. Listen Soom I understand that you're worried about your daughter and you want her back but you have to understand that the village is in a dire situation and our forces still haven't recovered from the invasion. I just can't send an army to find a few people even if said person is a future clan head, I'm sorry but I can't waste my efforts on this. She said while Soom just looks down not saying anything. She then gets up and leaves the chamber so no one could see the tears running down her face. Inoichi was about to go get her but Chuza grabs his arm and shakes his head while the Yamanaka clan head sighs. Hokage-sama, I know you don't want to risk losing any more and more of our ninja to this man but we can't just leave their fate in his hands. We need to send another rescue squad. If we have to let it be two squads. Chuza spoke up. Tsunade looks at them in disbelief. Are you serious? Do you realize that I'm sending a squad to face someone whose reputation could and probably on par with that of the Yondimis whose status had a flea on site order? She asks them and they look at her and nod. We're not asking to have them try to kill the man but at least find out where his hideout is and if it's possible rescue the four Kunoichi he has capped to. Inoichi replies. Tsunade looks around and sighs. Very well. I'll send two squads to find and if possible rescue them. She says then gets up to leave. Underground lair. After being given food, Enko was now wearing the skin-tight black body suit with a grey mini skirt and a black trench coat and was now scratching the belly of Hanon who was vibrating on her lap while Enko was giggling. You like that don't you girl? Enko cooed while the ferret lets out a gurgling noise. Naruto was sitting down in a chair watching this and then sees his sister walk in with her mask and cloak off and glares at her brother who raises an eyebrow at her. What? He asks and she just glares at him for a few seconds until she speaks up. I got boar blood on my outfit and I had to take two baths to get rid of the smell. Do you have any idea how gross pig blood smells? She says raising her voice at him but he shrugs. Yeah but I'm not a sissy like you or Imo Udo. Naruto says and ducks when she throws a black bingo book at him. Baka, in case you forgot I'm a girl. She yelled while he just smirks at her he then gets up and walks towards her. They stare each other down and then he thumps her on the forehead with two fingers, getting a yelp from the girl. Stop complaining so much, what would the old man say if he heard you crying over being covered in boar blood? He replied and then, wham. Naruto ended up getting hit with the flat end of what looked like a broadsword on the top of his head but ends up disappearing in a puff of smoke. Who are you calling old Gaki? Spoke a deep masculine voice. The one who had the voice was a silver-haired man wearing a silver and black outfit and a sword was resting on his shoulders. Kasumi looks at him and smiles. Hey tu san, she says while Anishi looks at her, smiles, and ruffles her hair. Hey squirt, is your brother giving you a hard time again? He asks getting a nod from her while Naruto appears out of the shadow of the walls and glares at Anishi. What's your problem old man? Are you trying to bash my skull in? He growled out while Anishi just shrugs. Don't be an ass to your sister Gaki. Besides, I knew you'd have a cage bush and take that hit. He says with a grin on his face but Naruto sighs. That's when the four Kunoichi's eyes grew wide and their jaws dropped. Wait, Anko yelled and pointed to Anishi. You're their father, Anko asked. Anishi blinked for a while the nods. Yes I am why, he asks like it was no big deal and Anko's eyes get even bigger and looks at Naruto. H how old are you? She asks and Naruto blinks also. I'm 17, is that a problem? He asks and Kurenai's expression is the same as Anko's. Nani. They both yell. 17. 
You mean to tell me that you, the Ryushi Juti, the most dangerous bounty hunter in the elemental nations is a teenager? Kurinai cries out in shock. Naruto looks at them and smirks. Yes I am a teenager so what's the problem? He asks and they just gape like fish. Kasumi looks at them and giggles. I don't see what the big deal is. I can take on take on two squads of Anbu level nin and not get winded. She says. Anko and Kurinai turned their heads so fast, you'd think they'd snap. A. Kurinai cries out while Anishi chuckles. Anko however scoffs. Yeah right Gaki like you could take on Anbu level knee, she said only to feel a knife pressed against her neck and Kasumi was behind her with a smile on her face but was releasing key, killer intent, making Anko shiver a little. I would appreciate it if you didn't call me a Gaki or underestimate me. I've killed Chunin, Junin, and Anbu level Nin and I have their heads to prove it. Would you like me to add yours to my collection? She asks in a sweet but deadly tone. A bead of sweat drops from Anko's brow and she shakes her head. Then think before you speak Anko. She says and then appears next to her brother who was looking the other way with his hands behind his head. Kurinai, Yugo, and Hana looked at the girl in shock. Kami she's fast. They thought while Anko still looked shock. Konoha main gate. At the gate of Konoha, Team 11 and Team 9 along with Kakashi, Sakura, and Sai were at the main gate getting ready to rescue their comrades. Asuma was in front of them and spoke up. All right listen up everyone, he ordered and they did. We are going back to the jungles of Uzu no Kuni to rescue four of our comrades from the Ryushi Juti. He replied getting shocked looks from everyone. Troublesome. Why is Hokage Sama sending us to face him? He's an S going on SS rank mercenary. We may have him outnumbered, but not outmatched. I mean you did say he was faster than you, Hitaki, and Guy combined. Shikamaru replied getting a shock look from everyone especially Lee who looked at his sensei. Guy sensei is it true? Was he faster than you? The second spandex wearer asked and Guy nods. Yes he was Lee, it was my sixth sense and reflexes that kept me from sustaining any serious injuries. His speed was on par with mine with my weights removed as was his strength. I don't even think he was fighting us for real, he said making the rookie's eyes widen and Neji decided to speak as well. It's true. He took me down with only two hits even though I attacked him from his blind spot. Choji's eyes widen, so we're basically facing someone who's stronger and faster than our senseis. He asks and Asuma nods while Shikamaru muttered troublesome. I'm gonna be honest with you. We're facing a hired assassin and hunter that make our Anbu and Hunter Nin look like amateurs. We have no idea what type of techniques he knows so we have to stay on our toes with this guy that and he has a partner who could be on our level. We need to fight as a group and not get distracted by anything. One small mistake can result in all of us getting killed, he said in a voice that meant business. The rookies nodded while a few gulp. And one final thing, there are creatures in that place that none of you have ever seen so be extra careful. Now let's move out, he orders getting highs from them and they move like blurs out of the main gate and head for Uzu. Question is will they all make it out of the place alive? Kurinai was currently helping Yugo back into the bed and Hana was currently sleeping with Benihime sleeping on the end of her pillow. In the underground lair the sound of swords clashing can be heard. Anko and Kasumi were in an underground dojo watching Naruto and Anishi engage in a Kenjutsu battle. Anishi was using his claymore while Naruto was using his Okatana. Sparks were flying everywhere as the two swordsmen performed a series of thrusts, slashes, and parries. Naruto does a horizontal slash at Anishi's chest but he blocks it with the flat side of his sword and he takes a swing at Naruto's head. The blonde ducks and ends up losing a few strands of hair. Anishi does a downward slash and Naruto rolls away. Naruto the lunges at the man and swings the Okatana and Anishi does the same. Their blades clash for a while then they perform several slashes at each other which were all met by cold steel. They clash one more time and were adding more strength to their weapons. Their blades grinded against each other and the two warriors were grunting and staring each other down. The blades started to glow orange on the edges and Naruto grins at the silver haired man who raises an eyebrow. Naruto then breaks the stalemate and pushes Anishi and the claymore back. He then kicks Anishi hard in the chest and sends him flying backwards and hitting the wall. 
The man lets out a grunt and when he tries to move forward, a blade was pressed against his neck. Naruto was in front of him grinning. Anishi sighs and drops the claymore. I yield kid, he says and Naruto removes the blade from Anishi's neck and sheaths his sword. That now makes its score 72 to 68 with me ahead by 4. Naruto asks and Anishi scoffs. Whatever Gaki. Oi, Kasumi-chan you're up next. He says. Kasumi nods and grabs her sword. Naruto walks out of the dojo with Anko following behind him. Naruto grabs a towel from a shelf outside and slings it over his shoulders, and wipes his face off with one end. Man I've never seen a sword fight as awesome as that one. I'm willing to bet you're a sword master right? Anko asks while Naruto nods. Yeah, you can thank Anishi and my Ka-san for that. They practically beat Kenjutsu into me. I got the scars to prove it. He said in a joking manner. Anko laughs at what he says. Too bad Yugo missed it. She's been practicing swords play since she could walk and I'm willing to bet if she wasn't still recovering, she'd challenge you to a duel. She said getting a smirk from the blonde. I bet she would. There aren't any decent swords men out there except for a few I met. So what about you? Ever consider learning? He asks and she shakes her head. I did at first but due to my past, I never got to learn. She said with a frown on her face. Naruto looks at her for a while and does the same. Let me guess, Konoha. He asks and she lets out a sigh and nods. Yeah, unfortunately my so-called home turned against me when my former sensei decided to go rogue. Hell, what's even worse is that even most of my comrades minus Kurenai, Yugo, and Hana keep their distance from me like I'm a plague. Maybe I should have left when they banished the Uzumaki kid. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this. So you don't hold any love for your village? He asks and she lets out a frustrating sigh. No not after all the bullshit I had to go through if I could I'd throw this stupid headband on the ground and spit on it. She said pointing to her forehead. Then why don't you? He asks making her stop in her place and look at him like he was crazy. Naruto stops and looks back at her. What? Anko's face then gets serious and have Hunter Nin hunt me down and having to look over my shoulder for the rest of my life. Not what I had planned for my future, if I had one. She mumbled and Naruto lets out a sigh and rubs the back of his head. Why not stay here? He asks and her eyes bulge out of her sockets. Are you serious? She asks and he nods. Yeah, this place is mostly jungle. No ninja would be crazy enough to face the creatures in the wilderness here and plus, this is my territory and if you were under my protection, people would think twice about harming you. He said and she thinks about the pros and cons of the offer. Sure she'd be away from the glares and insults but what about her friends? How would they react if she became a nuke nin? He saw the looks of confusion on her face and places a hand on her shoulder. If you're wondering about your friends then I'll offer them the same. I'm pretty sure they'd accept your decision if they were truly your friends. Besides don't friends look out for each other? He asks and then walks away from her while she just stands there and thinks about what he says. Recovery room. Hannah, Yugo were sitting in their bed eating what looked like stew from a bowl while Kurenai was sitting on a chair eating hers. The door then opens and they look up to see Anko with a look of confusion on her face. Hey Anko what is it? Kurenai asks and the snake user sits down in another chair and looks up at them. I'm just confused right now Kurenai. Anko says and the red-eyed woman blinks for a while. About what? About Konoha. I'm starting to have second thoughts about that place. She says making all three Kunoichi's eyes widen. What do you mean Anko? Yugo asks. I, I don't think I want to be a Konoha nin anymore. She says and their eyes become even wider. What? Anko are you serious? Kurenai yells only for her to nod. W.Y. Anko. Yugo asks in a serious tone. Anko brushes her hair back and looks at them with an even serious tone. You should know why Yugo. All three of you should know. She said while they flinch and Kurenai tries to be the voice of reason. B but Anko Konoha is your home and, she tries to say but then stops when she hears a bitter laugh come out of her. Oh shut up Kurenai, that shit hole is not my home. It never has been after that bastard marked me and left me to pay for his actions. She said and Kurenai cringes from the sound of her voice. I I know your life has been bad Anko but, but what? Snapped Anko, but what? 
You have no idea what kind of bullshit I've had to go through in that fucking village Kurnai Yuhi so don't ACT like you do because you don't. Anko yelled as tears fell from her eyes and Kurnai looked down at the ground knowing she was right. You don't know what it's like to have people glare at you every day and call you a traitor and a slut behind your back and have the ones who are supposed to be your comrades sneer at you. Do you know how that feels because if you do please tell me and prove me wrong. She challenged and Kurnai just stayed silent. I thought so, so tell me why I should go back to that place after all the crap they put me through. That's when Yugo spoke up. What about Asanko? We're friends right? Friends don't abandon each other. She says and Anko glares at her. If you were my real friend Yugo you'd want what's best for me right? What about what I want huh? Why should I give up my life for a bunch of bastards who could care less about me and then piss on my grave when I die? While the people were protecting her sitting in their homes sipping tea and relaxing, we are out there putting our lives on the line. Why should I give up what I want? Half of the things you three have I didn't. I can barely get a decent home in that place without having it ransacked. I had to spend most of my nights in a damn forest. I bet you didn't know about that did you? She asks and Yugo became silent also. Hey Anko we, we just don't want to lose you. Hannah said. Anko lets out a frustrating sigh and looks at the ground while wiping the tears away. Kurinai gets up and walks over to Anko and pulls her into a hug. I'm sorry for being selfish Anko. If it'll make you feel any better I'd join you if you decide not to go back to Konoha. She said and Anko looks up at her in shock as do Hannah and Yugo. Eh hey, are you serious? Anko asks while Kurinai smiles and nods. Yes I am Anko. If you choose not to go back to Konoha I will stay here with you. She says. And to prove it I'll do this. She undoes the knot in her headband and drops it to the ground shocking Hannah, Anko and Yugo whose eyes to widen at this. Anko smiles at this and removes hers as well. Then she tosses it near Kurinai's and spits on it. I can't believe you two did that. Hannah cried out while Yugo groaned. Anko grins and just hugs Kurnai while nuzzling her cheek. I knew you loved me Nai Chan. She says and hugs her even tighter. See can't breathe a eh, Anko. Kurinai strains out while turning blue. Anko lets her go and looks at Yugo and Hannah. What about you two? Want to join us? Anko asks. Yugo and Hannah look at them. Yugo can join but me well I can't. Hannah said with a downcast look on her face. Oh yeah your clan. Well I'm sure we can work something out. Anko says with a grin on her face. The door opened and a red haired woman walked in and blinked when she saw Kurinai and Anko. Ker Chan. Anko Chan. Way are you two doing here? She asks and both Kunoichi froze and turned their heads to see their sensei looking at them with a raised eyebrow. K Kashina sensei. Kurinai asks while Anko's eyes grew watery. Kashina smirks at them and crosses her arms. Well isn't this a surprise? All three of my students are here. The three of you have grown into strong Kunoichi just like I knew you would. She said but then was tackled by a purple blur. Sensei. Anko cried as she hugged Kashina with all her strength. Kashina let out a grunt but returned the hug while Anko sobbed on her shoulder. S Sensei. Where have you been all this time? I thought you died during the Kyubi attack. She asks while Kashina rubbed her back. It's a long story Anko-chan. She says Anko lets go of her while wiping her face with her sleeve. Kashina then looks over at Kurinai who was getting up and walks towards her sensei. Well look at you Kur-chan. You must be fighting off the males every day. She says with a grin on her face while Kurinai sighs. Sadly yes. So how have you been sensei? She asks. Great. I've been spending my time with my new husband daughter, and my long lost son. She answered and Kashina's eyes widened. Your son wouldn't happen to be the blonde male who looks exactly like the Yandaimi would he? She asks getting a nod from the woman. Yes he is and if you are wondering who he is then he's right above you. She said and points her finger up and they see Naruto hanging upside down on the ceiling staring at them. It took you two this long to notice me. What if I was an assassin? Oh wait, I am. He says with a smirk on his face and vanishes then appears next to Kashina. Hey Sochi. She says and Kurinai's and Anko's jaws drop and looked at Naruto who blinks. Sochi. Sensei the Ryushi Juti is your son. Anko yells while Kashina nods. Yep but Ryushi Juti is only a title. Do you know who he really is? 
She asks and Anko and Kurinai shake their heads. You should know Anko-chan. You cut my left cheek during the second part of the Chunin exam. He says with a grin on his face. Anko blinks for a while and then her eyes bulge and points to Naruto. Gee Gaki. She asks and Naruto nodded. Kurinai's eyes were bigger than dinner plates and her jaw fell. Naruto. Kurinai cries out. Hey Kurinai-san how have you been? He asks. They look at him like he's a ghost. Kurinai started to say something but then Anko yelled out. What the hell happened to you Gaki? You went from a loudmouth orange wearing shrimp to, to this. She says while Naruto looks at himself and shrugs. Meh, I hit a growth spurt when I turned 14. That and I finally got to eat something other than ramen and expired food. He said while they flinch and curse Konoha. Man imagine the reaction on Konoha's face when they find out that you are the Ryushi Juti. What's next? You're the son of the Yandaimi. Anko asked with a cheeky grin on her face. While Naruto blinks and looks at her. Actually I am. He says and Kurinai's jaw drops. See, he's also the son of the Yandai wait what? Anko screams out while Kashina laughs at their reactions. Come on Anko I'm practically a carbon copy of the man though I doubt those idiots would believe it's saying the demon brat is mocking us by looking like the Yandaimi. He says while the four sigh at this. Don't even get us started on those civilians and elders on the council. It's their fault Konoha is in the state it's in. Speaking of fault, Kurinai tell them what you did to Cyclops when he badmouthed the Gaki. Anko says with an earsplitting grin on her face. Kurinai's eyes widen and she blushes while rubbing her arm. I I didn't do anything major. She mumbled not wanting to be the center of attention because Naruto and Kashina were looking at her. Nothing major. Ha. Huh. Asuma told me how you bitch slapped Kakashi in the face twice and slammed him into a wall in the Hokage's office. Then you cursed the man out and ranted about how much of a failure he was for saying you had no talent as a ninja and didn't deserve to be one. It took both Asuma and Guy to pry her off the man and from choking the Baka to death. She then spat on him and called him trash and stormed out of the office. Not once in my life have I seen Kurinai so angry. I thought I saw the Shinigami hovering over her head when I went to talk to her. Anko finished and Kashina looked at Kurinai with a shocked look on her face. The red-eyed woman wanted to strangle Anko right now. Yugo and Hana were covering up their mouth trying not to laugh while Naruto grinned and appeared next to Kurinai with an arm wrapped around the woman grinning like a Cheshire cat. I didn't know you cared Kurinai-chan. I feel so happy, he says in a teasing tone and hugs her with one arm making the woman blush at the contact. Oh my Kami he's hugging me. And his muscles feel so grey no. Bad Kurinai, he's 17 for goodness sake. But what if he's into older women? No, no, don't think that, she ranted in her mind Kashina saw this and a gleam appeared in her eye. Anko saw this and was pouting because Kurinai always attracts the hot males. Hey why does she get a hug and not me? She whined while Naruto looks at Anko and smirks. You might try to cope a feel on me. He says making her sputter. I I will not. She cries out. You're lying hubby Chan. He says, making her brow twitch and turns away from him in HMPHS. Naruto then lets go of Kurinai who let out a small sigh but on the inside she was fuming because she wa enjoying that hug. Naruto then walks behind Anko and wraps his arms around her, making the woman tense up and then whispers something in her ear. Everyone watches as Anko's face glows red and she starts to giggle like a schoolgirl. He then lets go of Anko and walks back to her mom who was shaking her head. Kurinai blinks in confusion and look at a red face Anko who was having certain thoughts in her head and looks back at Naruto. What did you say to her Naruto? She asks getting a grin from the blonde. Oh you know, he says and snickers. Kurina looks back at her friend and sighs. Never mind, knowing Anko. She'll try to get you alone if you're not careful. She warns him. I know and I blame dad for passing on his gene on having a thing for dangerous women. Naruto says getting a laugh from Kashina. It's true. I was the only female aside from Sum who scared Minato. She responded and then heard the door open. They turned their heads to see Anishi carrying Kasumi on his back with her right ankle wrapped up in bandages. What happened to her ankle Anishi-kun? Kashina asks while the man sighs. She sprained it trying to do a counter-attack. Kasumi was wincing in pain and cursed. Sweet Kami it hurts. 
She says while Anishi chuckles and sets her down on the couch and places her right leg on one of the pillows. Just stay off of it for a while squirt, he says and she nods while laying our head back. Benihime ran into the room and leapt onto the girl's shoulder and licks her cheek, making her giggle and scratch the fox behind the ear. That was when a puff of smoke appeared and a raptor appeared before Naruto. Anko and Kurenai jumped back when they saw the creature but the raptor ignores them and speaks. Naruto-sama, those Kunoha Nin you and Kasumi-sama chased out have come but with more ninja. Do you want me and my pack to deal with them? He asks while Naruto shakes his head. No, I'll deal with them personally. You and the others steer clear from them all right. He says and the raptor nods. He looks back at Anko and snorts at her. Anko's brow twitches and she was about to pounce on the alpha but Kurenai places a hand on her shoulder and she huffs. You're lucky you overgrown turkey. She says and the alpha snorts again. Dream on ninjin. He says and disappears in a puff of smoke. Kashina blinks at Anko. Do I even want to know? She asks and Naruto shakes his head. No you don't. Ka-san, the Konoha Nin have returned. I guess that means I have to give them a reason to take my threats seriously. He says and starts to walk out of the room and Kashina speaks to him. Naruto, I'll go with you. She says and the blonde nods. The two walk out of the recovery room and Anishi chuckles. Those Konoha Nin are gonna be going home broken and that is if Kashina lets them live. He says while the four Kunoichi cringe. Kurenai, Anko and Yugo knew how dangerous Kashina can be when she is pissed. Uzugakur jungle, Naruto and Kashina, who were wearing face masks that covered half of their face, were leaping from tree to tree with their gear on. Their eyes were once again yellow-orange and with a tint of red in them. They're not too far Ka-san, and it seems there are more of them. Most of them are former friends though. I know, that bastard Kakashi is with them. I'm gonna break that traitor in half. She says and clenches her fists. Not if I do it first. Naruto says and they increase their speed. The Konoha Nin were also leaping from tree to tree with Neji keeping a lookout for the Ryushi Juti and his partner. They then land in a clearing and start to run across the field. Neji suddenly stops as do the others. Neji, what is it? Asuma asks and the Hyuga frowns. Something is wrong here. I don't know why but I sensed two signatures heading here but then they just vanish. Almost as if they didn't exist. The Hyuga replies while the others look at him in shock. What do you mean they just vanished Neji? Sakura asks while his face remains the same. Like I said they just vanished unless they did a camouflage based jutsu then I would have known. He said but little did they know, that underneath their feet, a dark figure was in there, waiting to strike. For Kami's sake that harpy can't shut up for once. What's the deal with her voice? Is she part howler monkey? Doesn't matter because they're gonna be going home broken or dead. Naruto thought as he snaps his eyes opened. Kakashi tenses up and leaps away from his position as does Guy and Asuma. Hey, all of you move out of that spot. Guy yells getting confused looks from them until the ground beneath them cracked a little neji. Lee and Tenten see this and hop away from the spot and the ground exploded. Sakura had her hands covering her eyes from the dust and when she removes them a fingerless gloved fist descended towards her and hit her squarely in the face and sending her flying out of the dust cloud. Asuma, Guy, and Kakashi saw this and the pink-haired Kunoichi went skidding across the ground with a purple bruise on her face. They then heard more sound of punching and grunting and saw Ino, Kuji, and Shikamaru fly out also, hitting the ground with a thud. Choji had his hand on his back, Ino was clutching her stomach in pain and Shikamaru was clutching his chest area. Lee, Neji, and Tenten appeared next to their down comrades in a defensive position. You four okay? Tenten asks while Asuma helps Ino up and Choji does the same with Shikamaru. Ow, felt like I got hit by an angry bull. Ino says while Choji nods. Yeah, it felt like my dad hit me only ten times harder. He mutters. Sakura is helped up by Kakashi while rubbing her jaw. Kami that hurt, I thought my head was gonna be knocked off of my shoulders. She says. When the dust clears the rookie's eyes widen in surprise and fear as they look into the cold eyes of the man who had a flea on sight order. The Ryushi Juti. Naruto stared at his former comrades but his eyes turned icy when he saw Sakura and Kakashi. They were traitors who only cared about the Uchiha. The more he stared at them, 
the angrier he got and it took all of his willpower not to kill them right here and now. Eno and Choji gulped when they looked into his eyes and a bead of sweat appeared on his face. Lee, Neji, and Tenten were nervous as hell. The man then started to speak up. Apparently the Hokage doesn't seem to take my threats seriously when I say I will reduce her forces if she doesn't keep her ninja on a leash. So tell me Konoha Nin. He says and his eyes close. Should I kill you? He says and the rookies cringe in fear. Or break you? He replies in a demonic tone as his eyes snap open once again, releasing key on the rookies whose eyes widen in fear as they each saw visions of their own deaths. Then it died down and they were now sweating a little. That was when Guy spoke up. Sorry Ryushi but we were given orders to find and retrieve the four kunoichi you have in your custody. He said and Naruto growled. And what was my answer last time? It was no correct. Well once again I'm saying no. Now we can do this the easy way or the hard way. He says while cracking his knuckles. The easy way is that you leave with your limbs intact. The hard way is that I make you leave or I kill you and send your bodies back to the Hokage. Pick wisely, he says in monotone. They all tense up. Meanwhile in the tree branches not far from them Sai was watching and pulled out an ink brush and scroll and opens the scroll. He's not aware that I'm in the tree. Now's my chance to catch him off guard. He says and prepares to draw on it until. Catch who off guard? Asked a feminine but dark voice. Sai's eyes widen in shock and when he turns his head slightly. He sees a red-headed masked female with yellow-orange tinted red slitted eyes crouching behind him. In the field Asuma was about to speak up until they heard an explosion from the opposite side of the forest. The Konoha Nin's eyes widen when they see Sai flying out of the dust cloud and landing onto a hilltop while skidding back a few feet. Kashina appears near his face and before he could react he was kicked in the chest hard and was sent flying towards the Konoha Nin. Choji holds his hand up and it expands. Choji catches the ink user and sets him down. Kashina appears next to her son and glares at the Konoha Nin. How dare you scum enter our lands? Who do you think you are? She growled out while they cringe at her gaze. Kakashi spoke up. We are here to, he said but was cut off. I wasn't talking to you trash so shut up. She growled and glared at Kakashi. The Cyclops's fingers twitch at being called trash by this redhead. I thought my partner made it clear to your leader to keep you fools in check. She says and reaches for the hilt of her blade. I guess we have to send you back in body bags to teach her a lesson in taking warnings seriously. She says and they tense up. Damn it. Asuma says and pulls out his trench knives. All of you stay on you toes and work as a team. Do not get distracted for even a second otherwise you can consider your lives over. Asuma calls out and the rookies nod. Kashina scoffs at them and speaks. Do you fools honestly think that your numbers will beat us? You brats are nowhere near our league. Kashina says as she looked at the rookies. Don't get why Ibo. They might surprise you with their teamwork. Naruto says and she nods. The Konoha Nin and the hunters stare each other down. Suddenly the two of them vanish in a blur. Kakashi tries to pull his headband up to reveal his Sharingan only to get punched in the chest by the Ryushi Juti and sent skidding backwards. Sai pulls out his tanto and swings it at the hunter's head, but he ducks from the slash and spears the pale root in the solar plexus with his solder, making the ink user cough out in pain. Naruto grabs him by the back of his shirt and then flings him into Ino who barely dodges the flying body. He then appears by her side palm strikes her in her bare torso. Ino gasps out but then ducks from a roundhouse kick but the blonde spins and leaps over her to avoid being caught in Shikamaru's cage main no jutsu and the Nara curses. He then sees a round object heading for him at high speed. Naruto dodges the rolling human boulder and Choji turns his body and heads for Naruto again. Naruto smirks and his hand glows blue and charges at the Akamichi. He then has his fist back and when he launches his fist at him. He punches the rolling ninja hard and sends him flying into the air and in a lake, making a large splash. Choji. Ino cries but then is kicked in the back by Ryushi and she crashes into Shikamaru who went tumbling backwards. Pathetic. He says and sees Kashina duck from a slash attack from Asuma's trench knife and plants her hand on the ground, lifts her body and pushes her feet forward, performing a mule kick into the man's torso and sends him flying. Neji and Lee try to flank her and strike her blind spots only for the redhead to intercept Lee's fist and leap over Neji's and avoid his palm strike to her head. 
She grabs his arm and when she lands, twists it and then grabs the back of his collar. She sees Tenten head towards her with a bow in her hand while twirling it. Kashina spins around twice with Neji and flings him towards Naruto who roundhouse kicks him in the jaw, making his body twirl into the air and crashes into the ground. He then sidesteps an incoming punch from Sakura and knees her in the gut. The pink-haired weakling keels over and gets backhanded in the face by Naruto. Weakling, he says and blocks a kick from Guy. The man then launches a right hook to Naruto's face and Blonde avoids it. Naruto s his fist back and sends it towards Guy's skull but he ducks and does a sweep kick at Guy's feet. The spandex wearer leaps over the attack and performs an axe kick and brings it down on Naruto's head. Naruto rolls to the left and Guy's attack creates a small crater. Naruto wastes no time jumps into the air and performs aerial kick angled downwards at Guy and ascends towards the man at an incredible speed. Guy sees it and barely manages to avoid the impact. A cloud of dust and debris rises into the air and the ground shakes a little. Naruto then appears out of the dust clouds and charges at Guy full speed. Guy does the same and engages Naruto in high speed taijutsu fight. Kashina was blocking and parrying Tenten's attacks with her katana while the weapon's mistress was performing a series of swings and thrusts. Kashina avoids two strikes which go for her head and leaps over her and lands behind her. She then lands and swings her sword down at her but Tenten blocks it with her bow staff and Kashina smirks under her mask. Well at least some of the Kunoichi and Konoha have skills. She says and Tenten narrows her eyes. What's that supposed to mean? She asks and Kashina tilts her sword up and flings the bow staff away. She then sends a kick towards Tenten who does a series of back flips and lands back on her feet. Oh please half of the Kunoichi that are your age are a joke. They care more about their looks, she starts to say until Sai tries to roundhouse kick her from behind and the Kunoichi ducks as the attack passes and she strikes him with a chakra enhanced kick in the torso, sending him flying backwards and into a large rock. Then they do their training. Why are you not like the other two? She asks and Tenten glares at her. Don't you dare put me in the same category as those two. She pulls out a scroll and summons a katana out of it. She then twirls it and charges at Kashina at full speed. The two of then engage in a kenjutsu battle with Kashina who was performing a series of slashes, thrusts, and parries as was Tenten but Kashina was using only one hand. I've been training to become a real kunoichi since the day my parents taught me how to throw a kunai. Those two are an embarrassment to not only the real Kunoichi but to women everywhere. I am not a helpless little girl who needs a male to save me. I'm the real deal lady unlike those two pampered girls. She says and swings her katana at Kashina's side but she blocks it with the flat end of her sword. I see, she says and then swats Tenten's sword away, shocking the sword mistress. She then sheathes her sword and grabs Tenten's arm and twists it behind her back, making the girl wince in pain. Kashina then wraps her arm around her neck and puts the girl into a choke hold. Tenten lets out a gurgling sound and grabs Kashina's arm and tries to pry it off but her grip was too strong. You are strong but you have a long way to go before you're at my level Tenten Higurashi. She says and her eyes widen. How do you? She started to say until Kashina releases her neck and arm and then kicks her away and then stops an incoming kick from Lee and a palm strike from Neji by grabbing his wrist and Lee's ankle she then smirks and starts to spin while swinging the shocked taijutsu user around the air. She then stops and slams Lee into the ground face first and she grabs Neji by the neck and slams him into the ground hard, creating an imprint of the boy. Nice try, she says. She then hears a bone-shattering punch and a scream at Naruto's direction and sees Kakashi get punched in the ribs by a chakra-enhanced punch and then keels over from having four of his ribs broken. Naruto the kicks him squarely in the jaw and he hits the ground face first. Asuma sends a right hook at the blonde hunter but then the hunter blocks it with his palm and strikes the man in the side with an elbow. Guy swings a right hook at his face but Naruto crouches down and plants his hands on the ground. He pushes his lower body forward with his legs spread out and locks them around Guy's waist, shocking the man. Naruto smirks under his mask and then he twists his lower body and swings it around with Guy still locked in his legs and he then flings the man at Asuma and they are sent tumbling through the grass. He then sees Choji in the air with his arms expanded and he comes down performing a hammer fist at Naruto who leaps back as the move creates a small crater. 
Cho Ji then gets up and starts swinging a series of left ad right hooks at the hunter but he ducks and evades them. Gur holds still. Cho Ji yells that he swings another right hook. Naruto stops and the grabs the enlarged hand shocking Cho Ji who then tries with his left but Naruto catches it also and squeezes both hands tightly. Cho Ji struggles to push his arms forward, but Naruto lowers the fists down slowly as the Akamichi continues to struggle. Naruto then smashes his forehead into Choji's, stunning the bulky Nin. He then performs a left and right hook onto his face and then punches him into the gut hard. Choji spits up saliva and Naruto grabs him by his mane and flings him over to Ino who barely catches him and they both skid back a little. That was a bad move on them because Naruto appears before them and kicks Choji in the stomach with enough force to send both him and Ino flying. Shikamaru had a look of shock on his face. Unbelievable. This guy is too strong and too fast. He doesn't let his guard down for even a second. He ranted into his mind but then Naruto vanishes and Palm strikes Shikamaru in the face sending him backwards. You shouldn't daze off Nara. He says as Shikamaru crashes into the ground and darkness consumes his vision. Kashina is seen holding a struggling and squirming Sakura in the air by her throat. TCH. Are you even a real Kunoichi? Look at you. You're so pathetic. She says and adds more pressure into her hand squeezing the pink-haired girl's throat even further. It would be an insult to kill my clan to kill a weakling like you. I wouldn't even feed your corpse to my summons. She then throws Sakura with enough force to send her crashing into Sai who lets out a grunt. Naruto then appears next to his mother with a bored expression on his face. Neji and Lee struggle to get out of their imprints in the earth. Tenten was rubbing her sore back and Kakashi was now clutching his left side. Asuma and Guy were panting heavily and had bruises on their faces. Damn it, we can't fight them like this. They're too strong. We have no choice but to retreat. Asuma says and Guy nods. Yes, I agree. He says and Kakashi just grunts out a high. That was when Naruto decides to speak up. I suggest you leave now while your limbs are still intact with your body's Konohanin. This is your last and final warning. Next time I will kill you and your heads will be mounted on my wall. He says getting looks of horror from them. Asuma gulps and nods. Choji appears with Ino's and Shikamaru's unconscious forms under his arms. Let's go everyone. This mission is a failure. He says and they all nod and shunshun away. Naruto looks at his mother and I smiles. Well that was fun. I got some exercise from kicking their asses. He says while Kashina I smiles back. Come on Sochi, let's go back. She says and they shunshun away. Underground compound. Kasumi was talking to the four Kunoichi about the times when her, Naruto and their parents traveled around the elemental nations hunting missing nin and meeting new people. Anishi was sleeping on the couch with a Playboy magazine covering his face. The four Kunoichi were amazed and Anko spoke up. So Kasumi, when did you get your first kill? She asks and Kasumi thought about it. I was eight when I got my first kill. I killed a Chunin from Takigakur. She says and their eyes widen. How did you take it? I'm killing another person at that age. Kurinai asked and the redhead sighs. I lost my lunch and cried for a while. Tu San told when I reacted that way it means I felt remorse for killing another person and didn't enjoy it. Let me ask this. Why would you three leave your village for Naruto? She asks. You go. Kurinai, and Anko look at her and think for a while. That's when Anko spoke up. To be honest with you Kasumi it's because Konoha has fallen from grace the day the Yandaimi died. It's become dirty and rotten and worse, the Hokage is not as powerful as we all thought. The civilians and elders have taken most of the cage's power over the village and are now deciding the fates of our comrades. They don't care about us. They only care about themselves and power and I will not stay in a place that won't give a damn about my life. I say to hell to Konoha. I'd rather be a missing nin. Anko answers. Kurinai and Yugo nod at her response while Hannah sighs. I wish I can join you but then I'd be a disgrace to my clan. I don't know what to do. Hannah says that was when Naruto walked in with his gear off as did Kashina. She sees Anishi snoring on the couch with a magazine on his face. She looks at it and her eye twitches. She then walks over to the silver-haired man and removes the magazine from his face. She then leans over and kisses him on the lips and Ishii opens his eye slightly and wraps an arm around her back and deepens it. The four Kunoichi look away, 
Kasumi covers her face with a pillow and Naruto rolls his eyes and looks the other way. After kissing for 10 minutes, they stop and Kashina pushes herself off her husband while he smirks when he gets a look of her cleavage. Hey Shina-chan, he says. She just smiles and grabs his hand pulling him off the couch and heading out the door with his hand in hers. Uh where are we going? He asks and she looks back at him with a seductive look on her face. To make me happy, she says as they exit the room. Kuran eyes, Anko's Yugo's and Hannah's eyes widen but still have their heads turned. Kasumi was mumbling words into her pillow and Naruto's brow twitched. Okay I did not need to know that, he mumbles. Anishi has a shocked look on his face but then a huge grin appears on his face and he then picks her up bridal style getting an eep from her. I'm gonna make us both happy, he says with a perverted grin on his face and he shunshuns him and his wife to their private room. Inside of a cave were nine shadowed figures and each of them were wearing black cloaks with red clouds on them. They were standing in a circular pattern until the one with the ripple-like eyes spoke up. Zetsu were you able to find out anything about the Kyubi Jinchuriki? He asks and the half-man half-plant shook his head. No leader Sama the location of the Kyubi vessel is still unknown. We have searched every part of the nations for his location but it seems it was all for naught. After his banishment from Konoha he just disappeared. Zestu explained while the man's eyes narrowed. So he just disappears without a trace. It's possible he's hiding knowing that we are after his biju. Kisame says while Itachi remains quiet. This will take our plans back a little yeah. Didera says and the hunchback next to him scoffs. You think. Without the Kyubi our plan will not succeed and I hate to wait. The hunchback says. A figure with green eyes spoke up afterwards. Sasori stop your complaining. If Kisame and Itachi had gotten the vessel back then we wouldn't be in this situation. He said while Itachi and Kisame glared at him. Shut up heart stealer. We would have gotten the brat if Jiraiya hadn't showed up. We were no match for him since he is the strongest of the Sanin and would have killed us even if more of us showed up. The shark man growled. Hey so you fuckers just ran away like a bunch of pussies. Pathetic. If it were me I'd sacrifice that old shit to Jashin Sama. A man with purple red eyes said. Watch your mouth Hidan before I shave you with Samahata. Kisame threatened and Hidan was about to retort until pain flared his chakra. Enough. Despite the setback we'll still continue with our plans. Daidera, Sasori, you are to head to Suna to capture the Aikibi container. The rest of you have your biju to capture also. The Kyubi container will be the last we go after if we manage to find him. You are all dismissed, he says and the seven members vanish. Conan looks at her partner and speaks. This isn't good pain. With the Kyubi's disappearance we can't complete. I know Conan but until the boy shows himself we can do nothing. He says and they also vanish from the cave. Uzumaki underground compound. Naruto was in the armory sitting in a chair sharpening the metal head of a spear with a smooth rock. After doing that for a few minutes he looks at the throwing weapon and analyzes it, looking for any scratches or chipped edges. He then gets up with the spear in his hand and twirls it a few times while he headed to a target. He stops twirling it in his hands and looks at the target for a while. A smirk appears on his face and he rears his right arm back and then with a quick throw he sends the spear soaring at the target. Shuck! The head of the spear hit the bull's eye and went through the target and pinned it on the wall. Naruto looked at what he did and smiles. Awesome. The spear penetrated the wall. He says as he walks over to the impaled target and pulls it out while the target falls to the floor. He inspects the head of the spear and twirls it. Not a scratch on it. He says to himself and then places the spear back on the weapon's rack. He heard a whistle and turned his head to see Anko who was leaning against the wall smirking at what she saw. Remind me to never get in your line of fire Naruto. She said getting a chuckle out of him. I didn't throw it using my full strength Anko. If I had then there would be a series of holes going through the compound. The blonde hunter stated. Anko's eyes widen in awe when he said that. I don't know whether to be impressed or scared. I feel sorry for the bastard that ends up being your prey. She said with a grin on her face. Naruto watches Anko look around and check out the different weapons. I have to admit, these weapons are pretty amazing. You've been trained in using all of these. She asks and Naruto nods. Hi I have. Ka San and Anishi were slave drivers when it came to mine and Kasumi's training. He says. 
Enko blinks wondering what type of training he had to go through. Was it that bad? She asks. If I had to pick spending my life in the forest of death over their training, I'd pick the forest of death. He answered. Enko nearly fell over when he said that. Are you serious? The forest of death is one place you don't want to live in. Why would you pick that over training? She yelled. Naruto smiled, revealing his canines and spoke. Believe me when I say the places I've been to and trained in make that place look like a kiddie park. He says while her jaw dropped. I can tell you're not kidding. Kashina sensei was a sadist when it came to training me, Nai Chan and Yu Chan. I can't even imagine the torture she must have put you through. You poor unfortunate bastard, she says as she walks over pats him on the back. I lived and that's what counts. I think she scarred Kasumi for life though. Whenever Anishi too mentioned the word dodge she'd twitch and have her hand on her kanai pouch. He replied while in a thinking pose. Anko's eyes were now owl-shaped. That poor girl, she muttered and her face returned to normal. Anyway I wanted to know something Naruto. Anko said while she followed Naruto out of the armory and though the lit tunnels. What is it? He asks. Those, raptors, do they come from a summoning contract? She asked getting a nod from Naruto. Yes they are but they're a part of an old contract that has been around since the age of the Rakuto Senen. It consists of ancient creatures who were a part of the evolutionary chain. Back in their time they were considered the ultimate predators. Raptors are not just hunters, they act as a team and are smart. Facing one of them would be impossible because of their claws but to face more than one is beyond suicide. They'll rip you to shreds before you even have a chance to scream. Trust me when I say being killed by a pack of raptors is the worst death you can ever have. Naruto explained. Enko was speechless. So I guess wandering the jungles here alone would be a bad idea right? Naruto nods and smirks. Yes but there are creatures out there that are more dangerous than the raptors. He replies. Wow and what about your eyes? They changed when we faced you and your sister not too long ago. Naruto closes his eyes and opens them again revealing a pair of yellow-orange slitted eyes with a red tint around the pupil. I gained this when I passed the tests of my mother's clan and from the bosses of the summoning contract our clan has. He answered and deactivated them. While they were walking through the underground compound, Enko was rubbing her left shoulder and Naruto noticed. So that snake left his mark on her too eh? I can get rid of it since it's weaker than Sasuke's version. I'll ask her later if she wants it removed. He thought and spoke up. Your neck bothering you? He asks and she nods. Yeah, that stupid snake's hickey is bugging me. I swear when I see that bastard I'm gonna mount his head on my wall. Right after I skin him alive and castrate the fucker. She muttered while Naruto smirks. It seems that I'm not the only one who wants to hunt that snake. He is on my top list along with the Uchiha brat and Akatsuki. Naruto replies while Anko looks back at him. Do you actually think you can beat Orochimaru? The guy's a sonin for crying out loud and managed to kill the Sandame and Yandaimi K's cage. She states while Naruto scoffs. Only by mere luck. Orochimaru beat the old monkey because he was old. If he was 10 years younger than Orochimaru would have had his ass handed to him. The Yandaimi K's cage was an arrogant and stupid fool for trusting Orochimaru and paid for it with his life. While Orochimaru is strong he acts like a snake. He waits for his prey to let its guard down and strikes without warning. Plus from the way he fights his style is based more on ambushing the opponent than doing a frontal assault. He stated while the snake mistress gawks. Still, do you honestly think you can beat a guy like Orochi Tem? She asks with a skeptic look on her face. Considering the fact that he's arrogant and doesn't have the guts to face his someone stronger than him, yes I can beat him. He says and smiles a predatory smile. Besides I'm pretty sure you'd like to see his head mounted on a wall and displayed as a trophy. He said while a smirk appears on her face. That smile suits you Gaki. You sure I'm not rubbing off on you? She asks in a teasing manner while he snorted. Please, more like my roommate, rubbed off on me. He muttered and he swore that Benihime was grinning like crazy while wagging her tails in his mindscape. Anko blinks a couple of times and shrugs. Whatever. So what else do you have to do around here besides train and hunt? She asks. Aside from that and traveling around the countries and gain bounties, nothing. 
I've been to almost everywhere in the elemental nations so there's not much to do except visit some friends I made and take job offers from daimyos and company owners. Heck they even offered me their daughter's hands in marriage's payment and I kindly declined but, let's just say said daughters woke up happy the next day. He said wiggling his eyes brows and Anko gawked. You mean to tell me that you, damn Gaki you must have balls of steel to screw their daughters behind their backs. She said with a cheeky grin on her face. Naruto looks at her but then smirks. I didn't. They offered themselves as payment with their fathers agreeing to it. He said causing her to face fault but get up with a blush on her face. W-H-A-A-A-T. Enko's voice echoed through the labyrinth. Kasumi was helping Yugao using physical therapy by helping her stretch and Kurenai was doing the same with Hana until they heard the yell and the red-eyed beauty sighed. Why can't she ever be silent for once? Kurenai mumbled while Kasumi giggled. That's nothing. You should see Naruto Ni and Tu San go at it. Their voices could wake the dead and kill them again. She said. Yugao smiled and Hana giggled. The Inazuka heiress noticed a red tattoo with a yellow outline on her shoulder and spoke up. Hey Kasumi is that a tattoo on your shoulder? She asks getting the other's attention. Kasumi blinks and looks at her shoulder. Yeah but it's more like a tribal marking than a tattoo. She said. Can we see it? Yugo asks and the girl nods. Kasumi then turns around and grabs the back of her shirt and lifts it, revealing three red marks which ended diagonally at the end of the right side of her torso they also noticed some faded scars on her back and torso area. Hannah's eyes widen as she looked at the tattoo. Does this represent your rite of passage Kasumi? She asks. The redhead turns her head and nods while pulling her shirt down. Yes it does. It's a symbol in the Uzumaki clan that states that I am an adult in the eyes of my clan. Naruto Ni has one also but his is a different color. She explained. We gained this by passing the clan test. It's not easy and doing it can cost you your life. Most of our clansmen died trying to pass this test. She explained getting wide eyes from them. And those faded scars, are they proof of your test? Kurenai asks getting a nod from the girl. Yes most of them are from the test but the rest are from hunting. She said. No kidding. Said a masculine voice behind Kurenai. The genjutsu mistress jumped back and turned around only to see Naruto with Anko standing beside the blonde hunter. Please don't do that. She said getting a raised eyebrow from the blonde hunter. Don't do what? He asks making her brow twitch. Appearing and disappearing out of nowhere. It's creepy. She mumbled while he smiled. I know. I just like messing with you. He stated making her huff up and fold her arms against her chest while the other three giggled until Kasumi spoke up. Hey Ni San show them your tattoo. Kasumi said with a grin on her face making Naruto's eye twitch. No, why not? Hana whined wanting to see what his tattoos and body looked like. Because if I do, a certain someone in this room will rape me. He answered and got slapped on the shoulder by a blushing Anko. Jerk. She muttered but then jumped when he popped her in the ass with his hand. Behave or I'll put you over my knee and spank you. He said wagging his finger in front of her face while she pouted. Fine I'll behave meanie. She said turned away Kurenai was google eyed when he saw how he was taming Anko. How? How do you keep her under control like that? She asked while Kasumi giggles and speaks up. Naruto ni contain just about any dangerous creature in the jungles here. If he can deal with them then dealing with your friend is not a difficult task. She answered. Naruto looked at Hana and Yugo and spoke up. So how is your recovery going? He asks the two. Fine. My ribs are close to recovering but it hurts to bend and stretch so Kasumi-chan is helping me using physical therapy. Yugo answered and Hana nodded. Same here. I only have minor headaches now. She responded. I see. That's good to hear you're both recovering well. You should fully recover in a couple of days just be sure not to strain your bodies. He says and they nod. Kurenai and Anko go and help Hana up. Naruto walked over to Yugo who blinked but then eeps when he scoops her up in his arms and held her bridal style in his arms. Said female Anbu had a small blush on her face while Anko, Kurenai, and Hana glared at them while he carried her to the bed and gently placed her down on it. Th thank you Naruto-kun. She said. No problem Yugo-chan, he said while Hanon leapt onto the bed and curled up into Yugo's lap and yawned. Naruto blinks and looks at the ferret. Hanon, where have you been? He asks. 
Hanon looks at him and squeaks making Nato chuckle and stroke her ear. You should really stay out of Anishi 2's secret stash. He'll turn you into a scarf or pelt if he catches you. He says until they hear a loud voice. Damn it Naruto keep that weasel out of my jerky stash or I'll turn her into a scarf. The silver haired merc yelled making Naruto and Kasumi snicker. Honestly too San should know he can't hide anything from Hano. She can find and steal anything she can get her paws on. The redhead said while Naruto went over to carry a blushing Hana over to her bed and gently placed her down while Anko and Kurunai fumed for a while. Anyo, Naruto kun, Hana says and Naruto looks at her. Yes, he asks, do you think it'll be possible for you to send a letter to my Ka san about my well being? I'm pretty sure she's worried sick about me. She asks while Naruto thinks about it and nods. Sure, I'll send her one via summon. It's the least I can do since your mom let me hide in the cabins near your clan's compound when I was younger. He said, getting a smile from her. Thanks, Naruto kun, she says, and he smiles back. You're welcome, he says, and walks over to the table and pulls out a small scroll with an ink brush and ink, opens it, and starts to write in it. A few seconds later, he seals it back up, bites his thumb, and places it on the ground. Kuchiyoshi he says and in a puff of smoke, a green and yellow monitor lizard with yellow slitted eyes appeared. U.S. summon me Naruto-sama. The lizard asks and the blonde nods. Yes I need you to take a whiff of the girl with the tattoos on her face as scent and take this letter to Konoha to assume in Azuka. He orders and holds the small scroll in front of the monitor's face. Said reptile grabbed the scroll and swallows it before dispersing. Well then, I think I'll go visit Gara and see what he's been up to. He says making the four females blink in confusion. Gara, the goddamn case cage, Kurunai asks and Naruto nods. Yep, I happen to be on good terms with him after that ass kicking I gave him a few years back. Heck I even assist some of his hunter Nin and Anbu in missions. Hey sis you wanna go to Suna? He asks with his answer being a groan. No but you'll just drag me with you right? She asks getting a nod and evil smirk from her brother. Damn it. I really don't like traveling to Suna. I hate sand. Do you know how uncomfortable sand is when it gets into certain parts of your body? I hate it. That's why I say away from the desert. She mumbled. Suck it up you big baby. Don't complain just because you end up getting sand in your trousers and walk around funny. He said but then ducks when a chair flies pats his head and shatters into pieces when it hits the wall. Shut up. You didn't have to say that out loud you ass. She yelled with her face as red as a tomato. I'm your big brother sis. I can embarrass you whenever I want to. He says with a cheeky grin on his face while a tick mark appears on her face. I swear one of these days Aniki I'm gonna get you. She mumbles and shunshins away while he laughs. I look forward to it Udo. He says and shunshins out of the room also. Kanahagakur in Azuka compound. Soon was sitting on a couch looking at a picture of her and Hannah who was eleven. She in front of the camera grinning with the Hamaru triplets sitting in front of her. Said triplets were laying on the floor near Soom and one of them whined while looking up at the sad matriarch and nuzzled her arm with his nose. She looks down and smiled sadly. I know, I miss her too, she says. Kiba walks into the room limping due to the fact that Kasumi struck him hard in the nuts with her kick and had to be on temporary leave. Kiba however was pissed and embarrassed because of what happened. Damn that female hunter. She didn't have to kick me that hard. He muttered as he walked back up the stairs but yelped when he tripped on one step and fell. Soon chuckled when that happened and felt sorry for her youngest pup. Hopefully he hasn't lost the chance to have kids from that kick. She says making Kuromaru who was sleeping on the couch snorted. That was when a puff of smoke appeared in front Soon, making her, the triplets, and Kuromaru spring up and prepare to fight whatever came out of the smoke. When it clears they see a monitor lizard looking up at them and blinks a few times. Soom in Azuka, he says making her blink a few times. Yes, the matriarch asks, I have a message from the Ryushi Juti about your daughter Hana in Azuka. He answered, her eyes widened and had a look of worry in them. What about my daughter? Tell where he has her now or I swear I'll turn you into a wallet and feed your remains to my partner. She demanded while Kuromaru growled. The monitor lizard flicks his forked tongue and tilts his head. No need for threats soon san I'm just a messenger. He says politely and his neck expands and when he opens his mouth, 
a scroll comes out and lands in front of Soom. That scroll will tell you everything Soom San, he says and disappears into a puff of smoke. Soom picks up the scroll and carefully unrolls it, praying that her daughter's remains weren't in the scroll but to her shock it was a letter and started to read it. Soom in Azuka, in case you're wondering this is the Ryushi Juti and before you freak out I'm informing you that your daughter is safe and sound. She is currently recovering and will be able to head back to Konoha in less than a week. Her injuries were not fatal but they were serious so I treated her and her partner. You also have two choices. I can have my summons escort your daughter back to Konoha so she won't classify it as a missing nin or you can head to the Uzu no Mori and my friends will escort you to a hidden location but do not have any Konoha nin come with or follow you and do not inform the Hokage about this. I'll trust your judgment and pick wisely. Sincerely, Ryushi Juti. P.S. Thank you for the time you saved my life. I owe you and your clan a lot. Soom finished the letter. She was glad her daughter was safe but was skeptical. She couldn't inform the Hokage or have any Konoha nin follow her. What was she supposed to do now? But what confused her the most was the thank you for saving his life a long time ago. She sat down on the couch and began to think about what she could do to get her daughter back. Kei's no Kuni Desert In the windy and sandy desert of Kei's no Kuni, two hooded figures were walking across the desert. They were Naruto and Kasumi. While they were walking, Kasumi was holding her cloak close to her body and her eyes were squinted. I hate the desert, she says to herself. Naruto rolls his eyes as they kept walking through the windy desert. Stop fussing already Imouto, I already told you that we can't summon because it'll cause unwanted attention for us. He stated while she mumbled. I hate the desert, Naruto just rolled his eyes as they continued on to their destination. Front Gates of Sunagakur At the front gates of Sunagakur, Chuchun and Suna were leaning against the wall looking up at the sky with bored expressions on their face. This is so boring. Why did Keisuke Sama put us on gate duty? The one on the left asks while the one on the right side shrugs. Who knows and cares? It's better than having to do patrol around the borders. I heard there was gonna be a major sand storm coming soon. He said. Oh yeah that's right. Poor bastards are gonna be caught in it. Now I'm glad I'm not doing border patrol Keiji. He said getting a nod from the other Chunin. Too true Seto. Though I'm worried about my sister being on border patrol. Kaiji says causing Seto to chuckle. Keiji. Kion can handle herself. She is a Junin and one of the best wind users in our village aside from Tamari-sama. He stated. I know I know but I can't help it. He mumbled. Making Seto chuckle. He was about to say something until he heard a cough which got their attention. They looked in front of them and suddenly gawked. It was the Ryushi Juti, Hunter God, and his partner aka Mashin, Red Devil. Hey you two how's it going? Naruto asks until they regained their composure. Ryushi Sama, Mashin Sama how's it going? Keiji asks only to be bopped in the head by Seto. Baka, don't say something so casually to them. Do you want to end up like that missing nin, Taro? He yelled at his partner who paled. Naruto saw this and laughed. Hey now no need for formalities. Me and my partner just came here to meet with the case cage if he's not too busy. He stated getting a nod from Keiji. I see well, the case cage is in a meeting right now with the council but you can enter the village if you want. Keiji says, all right we'll do that and don't worry we won't cause any problems, just be sure you don't become a missing nin in the future. He said in a mock serious tone. Keiji paled and started to sweat bullets while Kasumi sighs and hits him lightly in the ribs. Stop scaring the gate guards. It's bad enough most of the boys my age are afraid of you in this village. She stated, getting a shrug from her older sibling. Whatever, let's go find Tamari Chan and hear gender challenge brother. He says causing Kasumi to snicker as they passed the gate and entered the village. Meanwhile, two figures wearing straw hats and black cloaks with red clouds on them were walking through the desert heading towards Suna. They were Didera and Sasori. Hey. It's been a while since you visited your former home yeah? Didera asks Sasori who grunts. It has indeed. It's a shame my old home has gotten so weak after the wars. To think it has become the weakest of the five major countries. He mutters. From what I heard, Suna has regained more of its military force back when the wind Damu gave them more funds and higher ranking missions since they cut off the alliance with Konoha yeah? He explained. 
Sasori looked back at him and back at the sandy desert. Interesting. The so-called strongest village in the elementals is not so strong after all since they banished the Kayubi Jinchuriki. Didera snickers and nods. Yeah, from what I heard, the kid was a major influence in several countries. The leaders weren't very happy with that and cut off trades and alliances with them. Hey, Onoki Oji must have had a field day when he heard about that. He says with a grin on his face. Sasori rolled his eyes at his partner. Didera, what is it? The blonde bomber asks, have you heard the rumors about a merc who goes by the name Ryushi Juti? He asks, M-A-K-N-G Didera stop in his tracks and look at Sasori. Yeah I have but I thought he was just a myth. Rumor has it that he's never lost a bounty or failed a mission he was given. He also leaves behind the mangled bodies of his victims at the country borders with their heads gone. The way people talk about him, they make him sound like he's the Shinigami born of flesh and blood yeah. He answered. Correct. I heard that he has a flea on site order in the bingo book by Iowa, Kusa, and AIM. It is said that his skills rival that of Hanzo the Salamander who was able to defeat the three Sani. Didera almost fell when Sasori said that. Stronger than Hanzo? No way. The only one who could match Hanzo and live would have been either the late Shiroi no Kiba or the Sandame Hokage. I wonder why leader Sama hasn't tried to recruit him. Didera asks. Simple Yubaka, if the man has a flea on site order and is considered to be more dangerous than the Kiroi Senku would you approach him? Plus after completing his missions he vanishes. No one knows where lives. They say he's a ghost who comes and goes not leaving a trace of himself behind. He stated. Wow, I heard he keeps his victims heads as a trophy. Hopefully we won't be facing him in the future. I sure as hell don't want my head on his mantle. He said. I'll gladly do it for you if you don't hurry up. We have a tanuki to catch an eye. Yeah yeah you hate to wait. The blonde IWA nin said mockingly only to duck to evade a mechanical scorpion-like tail. You're pushing your luck brat. He snarled as they continued on to their destination. Naruto and Kasumi were in a dango shop eating some dango and soup when Naruto paused for a moment. Kasumi saw this and spoke up. What is it Aniki? She asks. I don't know but I have a feeling something is gonna happen soon and it's not a good thing. He said. Kasumi frowned and nodded. She knew whenever Naruto paused to do something and had a bad feeling it was something serious. I see, was all she said and they continued to eat, knowing that a storm was gonna hit Suna and it's not a thunderstorm. The end. Now we will see you in next video.